morning. Welcome to Racism and Race, the Use of Race in Medicine and Implications for Health Equity. This is the third in our series of sessions on this topic. My name is Kirsten Bibbins Domingo. I am the Vice Dean for Population Health and Health Equity in the UCSF School of Medicine, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's program. I want to begin with this number, one in 1,000. This is the lifetime risk of a black man dying from police violence in the United States. In fact, death at the hands of the police make police violence the leading cause of death for young, black, young men of color in the United States. It is this number and numbers like this that led the CDC to declare structural racism a public health crisis as it did earlier this week. I wanna underscore this number because it is this number and what it represents that I know many of us are bringing to our conversation today as we reflect on the ongoing events in Minneapolis. And it is this number and the number and what it represents that in fact our patients bring into the clinical encounter that our students bring into the classroom and that all of us bring into the work that we are doing, whether we are teaching, whether we are practicing, or whether we are conducting research. It's what makes the conversations that we are having both difficult and important. I wanna remind you of the shared values that we are bringing to our discussions today. We know that there will be differences of opinion as we talk about the hard work of actually applying our anti-racism principles to the work of understanding the use of race in medicine. The differences of opinion are in fact expected and welcome. We expect that all speakers and discussants are treated with respect and that while we might have different views expressed today that we have two common goals. Uh, advancing anti-racism in medicine and pursuing the best possible health and equitable health for all of our patients. So this series is examining a very specific um, uh, issue, how we use race in medicine and the implications for health equity. We've structured our conversation in this way. We began on March 24th laying the foundation with historical and current perspectives. We have been engaging in a series of applied case studies, and this is the second of our, of our case studies. We'll have two during the session today. We want to really take the broader principles and see how they apply to um, how we generate knowledge that un underlies our clinical decision-making and how we teach about uh, this body of knowledge as well. We really want to uh, lay the groundwork in these discussions for a, a more intimate, smaller group sets of discussions within the domains in which we practice in our, in our academic medical centers, in the domains of medical care, clinical practice, and clinical and translational research. And those conversations will take place over the next several weeks. This session four, as we're calling it, um, we actually are dividing people up by the primary domains in which they work, education, clinical practice, and clinical and translational research. I'm really grateful to uh, the broad group of leaders across our UC Medical Center campuses who've agreed to uh, lead and help facilitate some of these discussions. Uh, this is the opportunity for you, the many of you who participated in uh, our workshops up to now, to really be part of smaller breakout groups, to really reflect on what you've heard over these sessions, as well as help us to draw out principles that might help us inform how we educate, how we practice, and how we conduct research in a better way. I'm really grateful to many people, but I wanna highlight these four. So if you joined us last week, you know that we, had a, we started our case study with a really fabulous uh, video uh, that many of you commented on. And uh, 
Um, I'm really grateful to uh, Cameron Hicks, who's one of our medical students for uh, developing the script uh, for that video, as well as to Matthew Ryan, who is another of our uh, medical students, an MD PhD student, who uh, developed the script for the video that you will see second today in our session on polygenic risk scores. Our first video that you'll see was developed by two of our faculty, Dr. Delphine Tuo and Dr. Chi Xu. And thank you very much. These have been very popular, I think, in how people have received some of this information. So our session today, we have two case studies. And in each of these, we will begin with the video laying the groundwork for uh, the types of uh, details you need to know to understand the case, um, followed by flash talks and then a moderated panel discussion. I think both of these topics, EGFR and polygenic risk scores, um, will be uh, very interesting to you and will draw out many of, of the themes we hope to delve deeper into in our discussions um, over the, the subsequent sessions. Some housekeeping. Um, so uh, questions and answers during each of the moderated uh, sessions, you can put them in the Q&A. We have people actively monitoring the Q&A. If we don't get to all of your questions, we will use these for all of our upcoming sessions. Um, there are recordings of the two prior sessions posted on our website. You can access it through the QRS code. Uh, a video of this session will appear on that website over the next few days. Um, there's information on upcoming sessions. There's today's agenda. Importantly, there are speaker bios. Um, we have really fabulous um, speakers and and participants, and we don't have the time to give do their uh, their long CVs justice in these short um, introductions. We also have a library of resources. Many of the speakers have suggested additional readings, and I think you'll find that very useful as well. So let me get, let us begin with our case study two, which is our first case study of the day. I am really pleased uh, to have uh, two outstanding speakers scholars, experts in this uh, particular field, and colleagues of mine. Uh, the first, uh, Dr. Vanessa Grubbs, who is a writer. She is an associate professor of medicine in the division of nephrology at UCSF. And Dr. Neil Poe, who's professor of medicine, chief of the medical service at San Francisco General Hospital, and vice chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. Following their uh, their flash talks, we, they will join a panel that I will moderate, and the panel will include uh, Josh Adler, who's the Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs in the School of Medicine, Cynthia Delgado, who's Professor of Medicine and Nephrology, um, and a Chair of a, a Society of Nephrology a Task Force on this topic, and Dr. Stephen Richmond, um, an alum from UCSF who is now a faculty member at Stanford University. So with that, I think we will go into the video. Measuring kidney function is an integral part of routine clinical practice. The most important measure of kidney function is the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, which measures how well the kidneys filter the blood. GFR is used to guide many decisions in clinical care, including the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, eligibility to be a kidney donor, referral to a kidney specialist, eligibility to be waitlisted for a kidney transplant, and initiation of dialysis. In addition, Many drugs are dosed based on GFR, and some drugs may be contraindicated in patients with GFR below certain cutoffs. Unfortunately, methods for measuring GFR directly are cumbersome and not feasible for routine clinical practice. Instead, the medical community has developed ways to obtain an estimated GFR, or eGFR, from routinely available lab tests. The most widely used eGFR equations use serum creatinine, a substance in the blood that is freely filtered and excreted by the kidneys. However, GFR is not the only factor that affects serum creatinine. Creatinine is steadily produced by muscle and is also influenced by diet and other unknown factors. However, because the production of creatinine is generally steady in each individual, 
any changes in serum creatinine are predominantly the effect of changes in GFR. Thus, creatinine serves as an indicator for GFR as long as we can account for the effects of other factors affecting serum creatinine. Given the difficulty of measuring diet, muscle mass, as well as other unknown factors that affect serum creatinine, the scientific community developed equations that use demographic variables as surrogates for the unmeasured factors that affect creatinine. The two most common equations, called the MDRD and the CKD-EPI equations, use age, sex, and black versus non-black race in addition to serum creatinine. They respectively assign a 21% and 16% higher EGFR to black individuals compared to non-black individuals. However, although inclusion of these demographic variables led to greater accuracy in the studies used to derive these equations, the inclusion of race is highly problematic, especially since critical clinical decisions hinge on specific EGFR thresholds. EGFR equations using filtration marker alternatives to creatinine that are not epidemiologically associated with race are under investigation. One such marker, cystatin C, is available now, though widespread adoption has been slow, assays are not widely available, and cost remains a barrier. While the scientific community looks forward to a future with accurate, widely available, raceless GFR markers, we're left in a predicament as to how to handle creatinine-based EGFR in the near term. How do we ensure EGFR equations are as accurate as possible for clinical decision-making and research? Can we ensure that race is not being used in a way that reinforces wrong messages or produces barriers to care and health? How can we encourage productive discussions about this controversy to maintain focus on eliminating known racial disparities in health care and health outcomes? Excellent. Dr. Grebs? Okay, um, well, good as can be expected morning to everyone. I'm uh, thankful to be invited to present um, my perspective on this issue. I've been writing and talking about uh, this issue publicly since uh, 2017, but I have uh, personally been uh, aware of it when I started my nephrology fellowship at UCSF in 2007. And uh, since that time, I've seen it as something uh, problematic at best. And uh, really, to me, feels like we are in this um, predicament of having to uh, defend the humanity of Black people as not being inherently different than every other human on the planet. So with that, I'll just jump straight into the um, equations that were presented in the video. Um, the evidence is biased. So to go into more detail, in the first equation published in 99, there were roughly 200 Black participants. Uh, the researchers uh, put several biologic variables and self-reported Black race in the regression model and kept things that had a significant p-value, a um, very significant p-value, I acknowledge. Um, but however, there was no a priori hypothesis for why kidney function might be different in Black participants. So after the fact, the authors um, asserted on average Black persons have higher muscle mass than white persons. And here are the studies that they cited. I won't go into those in any detail. I just put the basics here to show you the age of the study and uh, how uh, sadly small and pretty much inconsequential to proving their point about muscle mass. And then um, one of the issues is that um, the authors did not give us a, an indication that the participants, the black and white participants were otherwise um, the same at, apart from race. And that data has yet to be presented or published as far as I'm aware. But we do have this uh, 
study that was based on a, a sub sample of the same larger study. And what we can see is um, there was a, a lot more high blood pressure and a lot more di um, diabetes in that, um, in that subpopulation. And there's no reason to think they would be vastly different than the larger group. And these are certainly factors that might explain why the black people in that study had um, a higher GFR than a given creatinine than, the, than their white counterparts. And then when we come to the um, uh, CKD epi equation published roughly 10 years later, this is where we get um, that um, the black othering is reified. Um, it was a much larger uh, 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 patient population. It was a tiny bit more diverse, but the issue is, is that it started with black versus other from the start. That's a decision. Someone decided to other black people. And as shown in the video, it reflected that if you're African-American, your um, measured GFR uh, was 16% uh, higher than every other human on the planet. So a question that I've always asked is how black exactly is African-American? And the best response I've received um, has been, well, it's black as you think you are. So, um, but in fact, this, what I'm showing you here is um, a set of pictures of celebrities, all of whom identify as black. Um, but um, as in the US, so because you identify as black, yeah, you're black. But in the UK, anyone who is biracial, such as these two celebrities, would be considered not black. And then I've asked, well, does this black count? Because these are not African-Americans, um, all um, beautiful black women celebrities as well. Um, and we've had several studies that show that this race multiplier is not valid in these African nations. And even one of the... Um, well, two of the researchers from the, uh, uh, the equation development acknowledged that the race multiplier or race correction um, was not necessary in those countries. And perhaps even um, uh, might, the difference might be due to diet, but um, why none of those um, hypotheses could be applied in this country is uh, questionable. So, what we have for, from the counter argument, um, at least what I've heard repeatedly and published repeatedly, is that self-identified race correlates with ancestry. And, but when you look into, this is the paper that cited, um, the, everyone that's participating in the study, they are assigned to arrays that are developed uh, based on these continental uh, stratifications. So it should not be surprising that people defined by race, which are defined by continents, actually correlates really highly to those continents by the assigned race. So it to me is kind of circular thinking. And then the other point is that the research has shown that the percentage of African ancestry correlates with higher levels of serum creatinine. And again, this is the study that is cited. And down here we see, this is the serum creatinine for the African ancestry, European and the Hispanic Latina. And <clears throat> what I wanna point out here is that um, there is very little difference in these numbers. It's certainly not something that has much clinical meaning. And um, when, the, when it's adjusted for several factors, to me, I find it very curious that only the European um, uh, uh, mean creatinine uh, moves as opposed to the other two. Um, so, and again, I don't see that as being much of a clinical difference and certainly not um, uh, much smaller than reflected in our um, actual equations. And then we had this publication that basically restated the old data. There's this, um, the authors present this lovely figure that shows um, how awful it is to not use the, the African-American race multiplier um, when approaching the um, uh, actual GFR um, here. And they 
uh, in response to an earlier publication which questioned, well, maybe we should use other things like height and weight to replace weight, the, um, these authors asserted that when they included height and um, weight without the race correction, it actually worsened the estimates for the black participants. But um, I, I'm saying this is old data restated because in the original study, the 1999 study, they talked about how they, because they adjusted for body surface area, um, neither height nor weight was an independent predictor of adjusted GR, GFR. So this is really like uh, just a regurgitation of things they already published when actually what would have been helpful had they would be had they um, presented a, a, an estimate of all the pool data um, and um, or actually show us that the participants were otherwise um, um, uh, the same besides race. Um, but instead, they just, um, you know, double down on the, the same original information. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, that would take years to do. But um, I, I, I think at this point, we can remind ourselves that, um, you know, we were able to create a vaccine in less than 10 months. So uh, crunching some numbers doesn't seem that um, impossible. However, um, the folks who are very much in favor of uh, maintaining the uh, race multiplier, excuse me, uh, have all of these dramatic um, uh, statements of what could happen by doing this, that medications will be denied and, you know, people won't be able to uh, uh, donate a kidney, all of these various things. But I'd like to point out is that um, what this presumes is that the race correction is valid in the first place. So if the race correction is not valid, and that's what um, we are saying, then all of, all of these things are pretty moot. And it also assumes that by looking only through a race lens, that that only affects Black people. It's not considering um, what uh, unintended consequences are uh, negative effects that has on all of us. And what's particularly um, um, ridiculous about this um, to me is that we already have another alternative. As presented in the video, we have cystatin C, which um, does not include um, a race uh, factor, correction factor. But again, I wanna point out um, that this is not for lack of trying because um, they did put it in the model, but thankfully there just wasn't a, um, a significant p-value. And of course, again, um, the researchers did not offer any um, hypothesis on why a, a protein that's produced at a constant rate by all nucleated cells might be different in Black people and only Black people. And, you know, there's been a lot of... Uh, discussion about how we, we shouldn't just, you know, change all, you know, rapidly without really thinking this through. But there is a 20 year body of literature showing that uh, cystatin C is superior um, to creatinine for estimating GFR. True, it is currently expensive, not standardized and not readily accessible. Most labs still send it out. So it takes a long time to get the result back. However, I remember in the early 2000s when we went through a very major process of standardizing creatinine as well. So to so use these things as reasons for why we should not just switch to the thing that is better and uh, um, already exists is um, just an excuse. These are overcomable barriers. So this is what um, I assert needs to happen now, that we need to go ahead and start the process for standardizing and converting to cystatin C. Of course, that will take some time. So in the meantime, we should um, report a single non-correct, non-race corrected um, uh, CKD epi EGFR, but actually with some guidance on how um, clinicians should interpret it instead of just assuming that race is the only thing that they need to take into consideration. For example, um, the true GFR might be higher than the estimated GFR if the person is really muscular or eats a very um, heavy cooked um, meat diet. Um, and similarly, the true GFR might be lower than the estimated if someone is very frail or has a limb, limb amputation. And what 
really gets overlooked, um, well, has been overlooked uh, almost entirely in this uh, national conversation over the past two, two and a half years, is that at best, uh, the, the true GFR is only has a 90% chance of being um, the estimate, the point estimate, uh, plus or minus 30%. So we're doing a lot of bickering and um, debate over um, precision that does not exist. As you recall, um, the CKD epi race correction is uh, 16%. And if we need actual um, precision to help make important clinical decisions, that's when we can get a cystatin C right now and when you don't need it, need the result within an hour. So um, my thoughts on why this hasn't happened yet um, is because we in biomedicine do not believe this definition of what race is that was presented in the first session by Professor uh, Dorothy Roberts. Um, all the social sciences have um, accepted that, you know, race is an invented social hierarchy to control people. Um, but biomedical scientists, as I said, do not um, uh, in mass accept this. And you know who else doesn't accept this? Are white supremacists. So to me, this is what it gets down to what is really going on. This, all of this conversation is not about evidence. It's really about a belief system that is rooted in an ideology of white supremacy and not to confuse it with white supremacist hate groups. This is not what I'm talking about. And uh, contrary to what seems to be um, repeatedly suggested, just because someone is of color doesn't mean they're not capable of upholding the same ideology. And intent does not matter. Um, impact is uh, what uh, has the consequences. So in the past, we've used it to justify slavery. Um, also, as Professor Roberts mentioned, um, this physician, Samuel Cartwright, uh, reporting on the um, peculiarities of the Negro race, uh, made lots of um, uh, uh, statements without any data, and also specifically mentioned the kidneys. Uh, and all of these things made them uh, better, uh, made the Negro race better equipped for being enslaved. Um, and today we're, we're doing just a, a different iteration where we're trying to use it to explain racial disparities. Some of our colleagues um, recently published in the Health Affairs blog that, um, and what we've all seen, that uh, almost every paper has um, repeated assertions of there's unmeasured genetic or biological factors that might really explain why there are these uh, um, disparities. And within their, that paper, they also did a PubMed uh, database search that, uh, so like in the history, there were only 86 articles that actually mentioned race and structural or institutional racism. And 32 of us, 32 of those studies have been since the uh, pandemic. So what I wanna um, uh, show you is how none of this stuff came out of the blue. Um, this is a slide that I've adapted a tiny bit and borrowed from Ruth um, Staus here um, that shows the real genealogy of how we got to the GFR race correction. And it started with this race um, science. We get the eugenics, um, anthrop uh, anthropometry, sorry. Uh, and then all of this somatotyping about who uh, the black man is. And this is the mesomorph um, and with character uh, traits and the shape of their body as being very muscular. And all of this comes down into the 1970s when we get this article. I hope you um, recognize the, the lead author because this is one of the studies that um, Levy and colleagues uh, cited to justify why the black um, race correction was needed. And again, this was a very uh, small study of uh, black children. And within the paper, they made these statements that these uh, differences um, uh, have long been recognized and corroborate the view that the races differ somatically. So here we are in this place of really maintaining the status quo. And something that was really profound to me from the first um, uh, session in this series is uh, something that uh, David Jones said, pointing out the asymmetry that race correction was inserted without really any evident debate, but somehow we can't stop it without extensive debate. 
And, and this is very evident from our uh, ASN and KF task force, the two largest kidney organizations in the country and um, uh, at least the ASN, the world. Um, it was formed about 10 months ago, urged institutions to make no changes. They did recently release um, a report that agrees that we should not um, have race-based correction, but um, we need further study um, and calling for uh, data from more diverse populations. So, um, and, and of course, by this diverse, we're talking about racial diversity. So we're, uh, we're going down this exact same rabbit hole of um, suggesting that there's some kind of biological differences between the races. And instead, why can't we define diversity by things that actually affect creatinine production or clearance, like diet, like if you have diabetes and how well that diabetes is controlled. We really have an, an obsession with this biological race that I really think needs to be addressed. And um, I'll leave you with this quote from the late Toni Morrison of exactly what is uh, happening here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Poe. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let me just get my thing set up here to share my screen. Um, I am happy to be here. Um, I'm, let me start with something personal. Uh, this picture in the lower left hand quarter is from a 1972 keepsake of, uh, of my late father. He was born in the Delta in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, came to Philadelphia after growing up in Louisiana and got the very best job he could at that time as an administrative officer in the Philadelphia Health Department. On Saturdays, he often took me to work when he went to open the doors at one of the health centers he oversaw. And there I met a physician named Dr. John Simmons, a black physician who came to the health center on weekends to provide care to indigent patients. I watched the smile on patients when they saw a black doctor. But what more amazed me about Dr. Simmons was his command of biology and medicine and how he used the best science to deliver care. And his patients trusted his care. Not surprising, that when as a junior faculty work member working in outcomes research in kidney disease, I took note of the hyper disparities in kidney disease and made it part of my scholarship, trying to understand why disparities exist and how to address them. And here's a sample of the work done by me and numerous talented mentees, often underrepresented minorities and women. So I was surprised to hear the chatter last year. Here's what I heard. Race was introduced in measurement of kidney function to be racist. Disparities in specialist referral and waitlisting were caused by putting race in equations to estimate GFR. Black persons do not have different creatinine levels than whites. Investigators assign race in studies that develop the equations. And normalizing black persons to the white person standard will solve the problem. Well, I'd like to posit that all of these are myths and I'm going to show you why I believe they are myths. And that drove me, that chatter drove me to write this piece last August. I said that black kidney function matters because black adults in the US are nearly three times more likely to develop end stage kidney failure and on average five years earlier than white adults. And I also said this, estimation of essential physiologic processes such as kidney function with variables do, that do not incorporate race and are more accurate than race is a worthy aspiration. Those estimating tools should have equal or greater precision, be soundly grounded in evidence on outcomes, and most importantly, be acceptable to patients. So let me give you my history of EGFR measurement. 
1976, the Cockroft-Grot equation for creatinine clearance was developed in 249 white men and extrapolated for over two decades to both women and all ethnic minorities. In 1982, there was a seminal publication in the New England Journal that documented the African-American disparities in ESRD that I just mentioned. And in 1988 through 1998, African-American disparities in weightlifting and nephrology referral were well-documented uh, for over a decade by Paul Eggers and by Craig Kinchin, an African-American fellow of mine who wrote this uh, article in the, new, in, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. In 1998, there was a published report by Camille Jones that showed that mean creatinine values were higher in US non-Hispanic Blacks. Here's the data from that study. This is published in the American Journal of Kidney uh, Diseases. Uh, Camille, Camille Jones was, a, uh, was working at the NIH and these are her NIH colleagues. But notice also her sister, Kamara Jones, was, who, is a, 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 who has written about the allegories of racism was a co-author on this article. And you can see that both in black men and, and uh, black women have higher serum creatinines in the US population from nationally representative data. And this is what they said in the conclusion, in the absence of information on GFR or lean body mass, it is not clear to what extent the variability by sex, ethnicity, and age reflects normal physiologic differences rather than the presence of kidney disease. And until this information is known, the use of a single cutoff point to define elevated serum creatinines may be misleading. And so a year later, uh, as, as Dr. Grubb said, the MDRD equation was published that included serum creatinine age, sex, and self-reported race with a race modifier for African-Americans. And they included women and blacks for the first time in 20 years. I, the similar, the similar situation happened uh, to Framingham, if you know uh, what happened, has happened in heart disease. And this is what they did. They had a gold standard now of measured GFR. And what they showed is that there were high, higher creatinine levels in black versus white adults at the same measured GFR. So GFR reporting was then encouraged, but you can see it took eight years to 2007 that there was 50% penetration of eGFR reporting in US laboratories. In 2009, the CKD epi equation uh, was developed that actually included an even more diverse population of Asians and Hispanics. Unfortunately, the Asians and Hispanics were very, uh, were a very small minority of the population. And although there was a signal that's published in Kidney International by a paper by Inker, they decided not to include that coefficient for Asians because of the sample size. And then in 2012, they modified the equation to have the CKD epi equation that includes both serum creatinine and serum cystatin, which actually is even more accurate than uh, either cystatin equations or uh, creatinine equations. And you see it still has a mild race modifier. It took till 2013, 14 years for there to be 90% penetration of EGFR reporting in US laboratories. And in 2013, the standardized assessment of kidney function equations was incorporated into clinical practice guidelines. In 2017, 2018, there were calls for removal of race from EGFR reporting and more calls last year and in institutions beginning to do that. And as Dr. Grubb said, in 2020, the NKF, this was back in August, uh, established the, uh, and, and the ASN, they established a task force to look into this because of the importance of it. And the task force interim report uh, was released last Friday, and I'll discuss that in a minute. But let, here's the key point. Disparities existed before 
the race equations were put into existence. Equation research evolved to increase diversity and to reflect the non-GFR determinants of serum creatinine. Another point very important is that research standards and adoption into practice takes time. And another thing is that race has not been removed in reporting in, in the way people, race has been removed in reporting the way that people have do, done things, but not in the calculations. So here is the interim report of the NKF ASN task force uh, that was published online uh, in April of uh, 2020. And we can put that uh, in the link for those of you who want to look at this. The task force sought a wide range of evidence and views with diverse representation, 16 sessions, 90 people from 19 US states and seven countries testified. And the task force developed statements of evidence and value. Uh, and if you, if you look at the report, there are almost 100 references in there uh, to, uh, to, to information and evidence from the literature. These will form a cornerstone in forging a path forward. The task force also came up with an inventory of 26 different approaches that could be used to estimate and report as, uh, kidney function, some with race, some without race. And most importantly, a set of attributes to be considered in making a final recommendation among those alternative approaches. So let me go through some of these approaches that I talked about in my article last August. The first approach, which seems to be the most common approach for those who wanna eliminate a race, is to take what I, it's, it's what I call the dominant race standard, discards for race coefficient, and reports the non-Black coefficient. And I believe it's discriminatory because it ignores data on Black persons from studies in, included in equation derivation. And it's less accurate for Black persons, but not for white persons. Um, you can see the institution, some of the institutions that have done it. And there are potential clinical and health consequences that Dr. Grubbs pointed out. People point to the benefit that it will increase referral to specialists and access to the transplant waiting list. But there are a number of harms, decreasing live kidney donation, curtailing the use or dosing of important medications like metformin for which disparities have already been demonstrated and pain control in, in African-Americans has, has been demonstrated to be suboptimal, as well as decreased contrast image procedures it could decrease access to clinical trials by patients being excluded and anxiety and labeling and perhaps uh, permit, prevent people from getting life insurance. So the stakes are high. And here's, here's the irony of this, that the expected impact on black patients in the United States for those things that I showed you, the harms on the right-hand side of that previous slide the number of people affected are far greater than those affected by specialist referral and kidney transplant. So we could hurt a lot of African-Americans. The second approach that he's used, I call racial phenotyping. And this, this was a, 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 a something that was done, unfortunately, at ZSFG uh, when advocates wanted to change, rapidly change uh, how GFR was reporting. So you substitute low muscle mass and high muscle mass for non-Black and Black. Well, I think that's racist because it assumes race is a proxy for muscle mass and that is, that stereotypes all Blacks as having muscle mass by attaching that to their coefficient. And it's less accurate for Blacks. The third way is what I call raceless range reporting. This was first uh, adopted by the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in 2017 and has been adopted at UCSF Health, uh, UC Irvine and NYU. And you report two values currently generated by the CKDF equation, but you don't openly tag them with race descriptors. So this recognized the, the participation in blacks in derivation studies and it leaves it also recognizes that EGFR, as Dr. Grubbs said, is imprecise and at least clinical correlation, nephrology consultation, and shared decision-making to ordering physicians. And then there's the raceless marker approach, the use of non-creatinine markers. And I think statin C is just one of them. 
uh, Dr. Grubbs pointed out some of the problems. I won't get go into those, but one additional problem is we know far less about cystatin. And most of the studies have been done in ambulatory populations and not tested in sick populations. And we know that cystatin C is an acute phase reactant and may not perform well in, in sicker patients. And last, there's what I call the blended race standard. And what this is, you could develop a new equation that would weight the participants in the study and come up with a raceless equation that could be applied to everyone. But if you just use black and white, it raises the question whether it should be done for all races. And here's the irony of this. It's less likely to be accurate for both black and non-black patients, but it may be equitable and acceptable. And that could have been done some 20 years ago, but that's what you would have had. So in summary, elimination of race for EGFR is a worthy aspiration, but the consequences are far reaching. And making changes is not a trivial task. We seek the correct diagnosis, not under or over diagnosis. We wanna avoid doing more harm than good when we make a change. And the use of many approaches across the US will make it difficult to understand GFR change when a patient receives care in different settings or institutions. If you're in Boston and you're at the Beth Israel and then you, you, you are hospitalized or go to the Brigham three blocks away, your GFR could change and you could have kidney disease at one institution, but not the other. That's a big problem. Some approaches promulgated to remove race, as I showed you, institutionalized discrimination or may be racist. So the solution be, should be consistent, durable, evidence-based and devised with the input of clinicians, system leaders, social scientists, and patients. And let me leave you with this. What we're trying to achieve is health equity. So where should we set our sights? There are huge drivers of disparities. I know that from, from, from being involved in this work uh, for, for nearly 30 years now. And we need to look at all the drivers that are really driving uh, disparities that I showed you and started out with. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite uh, the panelists to, to join us. Excellent, thank you. So uh, th thank you, Dr. Grubbs and Dr. Poe for those outstanding uh, flash talks. Um, I, I wanna invite first the panelists to each, uh, our, our additional panelists to each uh, give uh, just uh, one to two minutes reflection on, on what you've heard. You've each been involved in uh, uh, um, the, the debate that, that uh, both Vanessa and um, both Dr. Grubbs and Dr. Poe laid out so, uh, so nicely. And, um, and I'd love to, to have you each reflect on it from your perspective. Dr. Adler? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to participate in this uh, morning and the series. So uh, as you know, we, we recently made a change in our uh, EGFR reporting as uh, Dr. Poe uh, referred to. And so uh, I, we uh, discussed many of the elements that, that Dr. Grubbs and Dr. Poe uh, uh, elucidated thoroughly uh, during the, during the uh, first uh, part of the session. And, um, it makes it difficult, obviously, at the present time for health systems to decide which direction to go, given all of the uh, varying opinions uh, about, um, uh, about this issue and the, uh, the lack now of sort of a national standard approach, which it really is so important. That said, um, you know, some of the points were so persuasive that we, we needed to make a change here at UCSF Health. And so I, I very much appreciate the fact that our organization has such expertise and uh, allowed us, uh, unlike many other uh, institutions across the country, to take a step forward um, and, and hopefully a good step forward uh, on this point. So uh, just to, to bring everyone up, up, up 
to uh, the point that um, UCSF Health made the, the as uh, Dr. Poe alluded to, the decision to take the, um, the race uh, factor out of, of the reporting of, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Bouchard actually showed your email at the, the very first session. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and I know that, that both Dr. Poe and Dr. Grubbs um, presented at the, the committee that made that decision. Uh, Dr. Uh, Delgado, you uh, are one of the co-chairs of the task force that uh, Dr. Grubbs alluded to uh, that is uh, making a recommendation on this and published your interim report just on Friday. Maybe you can comment on that. Sure. Um, I, I want to say that this is sort of, both talks represent sort of the crux of our, our debate. Um, and um, really, um, both aspects or both salient points that were made on both sides of the debate are very important and highlight the importance of having this discussion on having social responsibility with the delivery of health care. Uh, and so um, over the last 10 months, uh, the task force has been really careful to make sure that the decision that's been that's going to be put forth really does have and have answers to all of those points that were made, whether or not personally for me as a clinician, uh, I truly want to know whether or not there will be consequences uh, before adapting an approach. And so having that discussion and having that evidence and gathering it really was important, I think, for us. Um, there was an illusion, there was a one of the discussants uh, said that there were 26 approaches that have been included in our um, in our report. And indeed, we do have 26 approaches that we have examined. I think it's important to understand that there are two different things that we're, that we're thinking about, right? There's removal of race from the equation and then removal of race from the reporting. Of the 26 approaches, there are 21 approaches that have taken one side or the other. Of those 21 approaches, 10 are creating based and 11 are non creating based approaches. Um, and you know, doing a careful evaluation of which approach would be the best for everyone, I think is, is important. Terrific. Uh, Dr. Dr. Richmond, um, you have been involved in uh, bringing this to the attention of uh, at the forefront of our health systems and, and certainly uh, in, involved in this discussion as well. Maybe I can ask you to reflect on the conversation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to our, our discussants on the matter. I think that, um, as uh, Dr. Delgado said, I, it firmly sort of um, sort of positions us right at the crux of, of the two sides of, of where we've been at. I think that there are um, some 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 ground that we can stand on that it, that is indeed common, which is that we're essentially here um, for health equity and we're here um, to achieve um, what is, is best for our patients. I do think that there are some significant underpinnings um, that are are complicated and um, allow for you know this divide to continue to exist um, and and in its persistence. Um, a lot of that sort of tension um, of, of what has played out for the last 30, 50, 100 years in this country is, is there and present. Um, so my background is, is really in critical race theory. I'm not uh, a nephrologist, I'm a family medicine um, doctor by training, um, but uh, I often wade into the waters of these discussions on the basis of an understanding of what race is, how race is used, um, and how it, it differs from racism, um, especially at the intersection of, of, of medicine. Um, I think that um, I had a lot of thoughts um, as as uh, the two discussants sort of proceeded. Um, one of which is is just that you know if we take a step back and we understand um, EGFR to be a case study, um, it is in fact that um, it is a individual um, um, sort of not unique uh, example of what has happened in medicine time and time again, um, and that has happened um, for for many different or for many years. Um, and so, you know, EGFR being a um, sort of, I don't want to say the hottest topic, but the one that has had, I think, the most discussion built up around it, um, it will serve as a precedent moving forward for how we think about these topics over and over again, whether it be PFTs or um, ASCVD scores or um, VBAC calculators, it will be sort of um, the, the, the benchmark in, in the ways in which we think about this. So again, as Dr. Delgado mentioned, you know, 
being very uh, careful um, and thoughtful about the approach is, is really, really important. Um, and I, I want to um, sort of speak to that for a moment because I feel that, um, you know, we have a, an opportunity for a turning point here, an opportunity to sort of make a left turn instead of a right turn, instead of, you know, repeating past mistakes that have been over and over and over again um, um, per persisted um, because of the historical presence of white supremacy in this country. We have an opportunity here to interrupt that process and to do something different, to say that we stood on the right side of history um, and did so for the right reasons. Um, and so, um, <laughs> It, I think is challenging when we have this presentation of what feels right um, because of our training, our education, what feels, okay, this is normative. This is the way that we have always followed along in, um, in our, our academic, in our medical, in our clinical practice um, to sort of go against that and to stand on something different, to stand on um, these principles of equity, which we often don't do in medicine because um, they are sort of uninformed by what feels like the right um, the right, uh, the right way to evidence. So I want to um, make an opportunity in, in this panel at some point in time to question how our evidence has actually been constructed. Um, we, we have um, for so long, um, sort of with reckless abandon almost, uh, just given ourselves to, um, to evidence, what the evidence shows, what the evidence shows, but not, not really question how the machine that produces that evidence itself can be biased, um, itself can be um, sort of improperly route and constructed in the ways in which those results, those interpreters, those clinical practices um, that result from that contaminated evidence our contaminated process um, can produce um, and reproduce harm over and over and over again. So I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry to go on, but um, I do again appreciate um, being here and look forward to a continued conversation with the rest of the discussants. Great. So I, I framed this as a as um, it, it is a debate, and um, uh, I, I would I, I want to um, press um, all of you to. To, um, to try to see where are the areas that we, we, we agree and, um, and that this conversation is about what the next step forward is, what we should do tomorrow, given the importance of this problem, or, or where do we actually have fundamental disagreements, right? Vanessa or Neil, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I'll go uh, Dr. Grubbs or Dr. Poe. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking to the other uh, the panelists, but um, yes, I'm happy to weigh in on this. I think um, what is most striking um, about the, the two different camps is um, uh, the, the camp that wants to maintain or think race is important to keep in our equations uh, is all, all hinges upon there being a uh, biologic difference between the races. And I, I feel like if we could actually accept that it is not, even though that's what we've been doing since um, the, you know, slavery, um, that we could actually uh, move on to a, a different way of seeing things. So, I, I, you know, to me, all of this there, as I present it, there's a lot of conversation about the evidence and who said whatever, but in truth, um, it's really about a belief system that um, the, the different races represent something different biologically. So um, to me, that's, that's the only way forward is for medicine to understand, acknowledge that it really has a problem in upholding white supremacy ideology, and then we can move forward. Dr. Poe? Yeah, so I, I would say that we could all agree that in an ideal world, we wouldn't use this variable called race. But race may be a surrogate for a variety of things, for some social and perhaps even some biological things, but it is a social construct. There is no question about that. But there's something when you look at GFR that race is capturing in terms of the non-GFR determinants of serum creatinine. And so if that's different and science shows it's different, we don't use that information to take the best care of our patients. 
that's not the right thing to do. It's not the use of race. It's the misuse of race. And I think each of these clinical situations, whether it's pulmonary function test or looking at cognitive function, which is very similar to the GFR argument or, you know, GFR or, you know, the indices for uh, cardiac surgery and looking at survival that include race, they're all very, very nuanced. And we can't have a blanket approach that says, just remove it because you gotta have a replacement. And the reason for that replacement is that you could do, if you, if you don't look carefully at the evidence, you could do more harm to African-Americans than the good that we're all trying to achieve. So this is very nuanced. I encourage people to think before they act um, and to look at all the evidence and particularly as Dr. Delgado said, the consequences that will happen from different approaches that are taken. I'm in this because I want to do the best for my patients and my minority patients. And I want to use science and evidence to drive that. Um, and I just, I want to think, I don't want to just have a blanket approach uh, because medicine is more nuanced than that. So Dr. Richmond, you've argued that, that it's, a, it's the base of knowledge from which we are deriving these, these decisions that is in fact problematic and, and the way in which we've constructed that base of knowledge. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, I think um, you, any, you know, any, when, when we think about the misuse, as, as uh, Dr. Poe had called it, the, the misuse of race, um, any sort of assumption or presumption that allows for race um, to be used um, or upheld in a way that it's suggested as a sort of biological factor, that there's an underlying biological association is in fact a misuse. And whether that appears as, you know, the sort of current um, non-Black uh, or should I say uh, African-American or non-African-American dichotomy or a blended, um, a blended equation um, as, as Dr. Poe was suggesting uh, could be, serve as a uh, appropriate replacement. It still sort of goes back to the same idea of um, improper categorization of individuals based on a social construct. The idea that a, a individual could um, be fully captured, um, their, their, their biology, that their exposures, um, that their um, sort of ancestral history or makeup could be fully captured in the way that they sort of wake up in the morning and decide to self-identify is, is, it just, it, it just, to, to me, you know, <laughs> I keep getting this, getting back to this, you know, Dr. Post, you know, you want to think, you want to think, you want to think. And, and, and to me, it, it's the critical thinking that um, has been obviated um, from mm. this entire space that has allowed for this exact problem to persist over time. If, if you have race, for example, and people um, sort of identify as black, white, Hispanic, or other, um, I, I think these are discrete arbitrary categories that um, essentially started off as socio-political designations, classifications um, that were constructed by government as a way of um, sort of organizing and distributing power. And they continue to be that in this country. Um, and to uh, uh, afford or to allow for um, medicine um, to be sort of based on that is essentially to, to further that goal of white supremacy as it is invested and structuralized in this country through through sort of racist um, um, racist principles. I mean, I, I think that um, race is, um, I'll give you an example by, by, by way of example, and I think I had mentioned this to you, um, Dr. Uh, Bivens Domingo, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, 
I was reading this article on CNN around, about uh, politicians in Brazil. This just came out a week ago, and it said that about 43,000 um, Brazilian politicians changed their, uh, their, their racial self-identification from what it was to something different, whether that be white, Hispanic, or um, Black, um, Hispanic, or Latino, I should say, Latinx. Um, and uh, this has happened over the course of four to five years. Now, I wanna fully understand, and I'll, I'll actually invite Dr. Poe to, to in, in respond to this. For those 43,000 politicians that decided overnight because of uh, political reasons to change their race, um, how does medicine see that? What do, what do we, how do we hold these individuals in a race conscious way? How do we uh, decide to do something that's accurate and precise for those individuals who have decided based on their political leanings to self-identify in a different way now uh, because of uh, um, sort of because of, of, of the, the sort of conditions in, in their socio-political environment? What would you do for those individuals? So if I understand you, this you're saying that that people manip may manipulate their race to their advantage. Is it, the reporting of their race to advantage? Did I get that right? Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that people self-identify differently based on um, environmental factors, um, based on social factors, based on political factors that race is something that can change over time, whereas biology and ancestry typically is not thought of, thought of in that way. Right. So the way I think of this is that there, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Race, you know, race and ethnicity is not the only characteristic that we, you know, that we have, you know, geography and ancestry, uh, you know, sex, uh, sexual orientation, sexual identity. I mean, it, we're a heterogeneous society, right? And, and, and even our labels and the way we look at ourselves have changed over time, right? So we have to be, and I think you're, you're getting at this, we have to be learning people. And we do have to adapt to the changing uh, definitions. But I think we need to look and say, is the way that people are applying something the wrong way to apply it? Or is it a good way? In fact, people love their identity. Um, I, I love my identity. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, and I hope this doesn't bother anybody, you know, for the first uh, nine years of my life, I was called the Negro. And I looked down at myself because I had to fill out that form in school that I and it said Negro. And then in 1965, James Brown came out with a record called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. And that was an enormous uplift because it said, I don't, I, I, my identity can be good. <laughs> okay, my identity could be good. Um, and we all have that for no matter what the characteristics we're talking about. And, and so the, the way I look at this is what are we using any tool of characterizing it any, how, how are we applying it? And so we need to do a deep dive and, and we need to censor the, in, the inappropriate application of any identity fact. But we also need to embrace our identity. And I, Sorry, even did you say you wanted to censor I, people's I, identity? Since I treat, you know, um, many come to minority physicians and say, I, you know, I, it's great, I have a minority physician. So you're going to treat me because of my identity. You know, as a minority physician, what is good for me. And, be, and and they believe sometimes that there's different things are better for them or their needs are different. So we need to embrace that. We shouldn't just say, we, oh, we're, we're just, we're gonna make this raceless, you know. We need to think and we need to, if we're engaging patients, we need to ask our patients and share decision-making and education about what we do. And this, and, and race is not the only 
the only identity factor here too. It's every, all of it, all of it. And that will make us better doctors. So let me, let me probe just a little bit. Um, uh, we have a question that's come in about uh, many of us, uh, we're all clinicians, um, we always invoke the patient. Um, but I, I'd urge you to reflect, um, and maybe I'm going to ask Dr. Adler and, and Dr. Delgado to start first to, on what do we think it means to have a conversation with a patient that sees a, a, a different correction or a, a different number that and the the attribution of that different number to their race. What what does that mean? And and then um, and then uh, for, for both of you too, Dr. Delgado, and Dr. Adler, to think of you you both uh, are representing acting on behalf of of larger organizations, right? So what does that mean to then make those decisions for? Um, we're all individual, as as Neil says, and have these and um, uh, you know our identities are important. But you are making decisions that affect how we then treat large groups of patients, right? Um, in systematic ways, different ways, right? Um, Dr. Adler, would you reflect a little on that? Sure. Um, so I, I think you're, you're actually hitting on, you know, wh wh why would UCSF Health, why would the other organizations that have changed their EGFR reporting, why would they do it in advance of some national new guideline? And I think for, for us, it was just this point you're making now, which is, that although there were many factors considered, many of which were important and relevant to the, this decision, the, probably the most important was the degree to which for, for our own uh, clinician environment, as well as for patients, that the, the continued use of race in the reporting of EGFR clearly contributes to this notion that has been brought up many, many times of race as a, as a coming from a biological framework rather than a socio-political framework. And that as an institution, we, we did not feel that we, that that was right. That that, like, that should not be something that we, we publish, we, we report on, or we distinguish, let alone the, the fact that in the, the um, age of electronic health records with greater and greater access. Uh, in fact, most recently, open notes now for all patients across the country, that, that having a distinction of a test result based on race um, for our patients with one no explanation, um, but even if there were an explanation, it, it just is the, for the reasons we've just discussed, not the right thing for us all to be doing. Um, and so even in the absence of a national recommendation, it was that fact that led to the decision to, uh, you know, uh, to take race out of the reporting uh, at UCSF Health. Dr. Delgado? So on a national level, both the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology have already come out and said that race is a social, not a biological construct, and it should be removed from future reporting. Um, on a clinical level, as a nephrologist, um, you, you alluded to the question of how does this affect the patient-physician relationship and the dialogue you have with your patient. You know, I run the low kidney function clinic at the San Francisco VA, um, and you know, I, I do want to remind everyone that the although this topic that we're debating now is really important, uh, when we're talking about kidney function decline and planning for other services that are needed, there's more to the story than just looking at the EGFR report. Um, you know, we look at other parameters related to kidney function decline that also help create the dialogue with the patient to decide on what might be the best uh, plan of action given whatever the patient decides is really important. Personally, I believe that that's a moment for a dialogue to talk about the accuracy of the equations and whether or not my elderly patient population would have even been included in some of these equation derivations. Um, and you know, at moments when I don't know that the equation is appropriate, I, I should say that the VA still uses the four variable MDRD and the San Francisco VA does have Sustancy available. I confirm 
Um, but beyond that confirmation, there's also the blood urea nitrogen trend. There's also, you know, level of acidosis. There's also uh, how the patient feels. Um, there's been this discussion a little bit alluding uh, on muscle mass. Well, you know, patients who have severe CKD and have kidney function decline have severe muscle atrophy. And at the same time, they have uh, an increase in volume overload. So using a guide for muscle, act muscle mass you know, with an estimating equation doesn't seem to gel quite well with the, the clinical care of our patients. So, you know, having that dialogue, understanding where the patient wants to be, what's important to them, and then giving them the framework for how you're thinking of what the information is in front of you is really important. Um, and I, I really do appreciate this dialogue and the, the um, thoughtfulness with which we're all approaching this because it is important um, for us to talk about as Dr. Richmond talked about the, you know, the role of race and how this is a, a, an inflection point to make a left turn um, and really lead this country uh, as an organization into dismantling the areas in which race should not be included in clinical decision making. Thank you. So uh, I, one of the most challenging things I think um, when we um, educate uh, uh, new physicians, uh, medical students, any type of clinician is to how we incorporate um, uh, the fact that we are uncertain about many things into giving them uh, guidance for how to make clinical decisions. And in this case, we have the issues of uncertainty against um, the larger sociopolitical backdrop of of uh, race and uh, racism in medicine as we've been talking about. So what's your advice to how we should teach about this? If you are teaching the medical students and, uh, and, and, and not the great lectures that you've given, but how, how would you uh, tell the medical student who's rotating and following you through clinic about whatever, whatever version of EGFR is presented in clinic how, how would you teach the medical student about how to approach this particular topic in the clinical decisions as they're learning to take care of a patient? I'd like to weigh in on this um, yeah. because this is something that I um, have been doing uh, during my 10 years of being on faculty at San Francisco General and running our uh, version of uh, the clinic that Dr. Delgado is speaking of for um, patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. And what I would tell them is I would explain to them uh, where this uh, whole if African-American uh, thing came from and it, uh, explain to them that supposedly it was a proxy for muscle mass, um, wasn't really backed up by much. Um, and so that we need to be much more thoughtful about it, that it's not just about the race of the person, because clearly what we can see for patients um, uh, who are approaching in stage kidney disease, uh, they are losing muscle mass. And as I present it, I, I think the, the problem with only suggesting that race is the, um, the deciding factor is um, really uh, problematic and um, uh, inaccurate for all the patients, not just the black patients. And so, um, and I have never encountered a student or a resident for that matter, and not even some of the nephrology fellows were aware of this background. So I think this is really, uh, you know, just shows us how entrenched our beliefs about race um, can be, that nobody bothers to question it because, I mean, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been and everybody's doing it this way without really being thoughtful about it. And when the conversation talks about, you know, this is a very nuanced thing, uh, I, I question who is it nuanced for? Because it's lumping all Black people together and suggesting that all Black people are fundamentally different than everybody else on the planet without any real explanation. I mean, you know, as I've written um, and, and spoken about before, nephrology is supposed to be this uh, field of real precision. And yet when it comes to kidney function is, if you think you black, <laughs> that's the only decision point, rather than thinking about whether or not people are vegan, whether or not people are bodybuilders, uh, what particular medications they're uh, taking. And uh, these are all the things that really affect when we're talking about creatinine, um, the production 
um, of, uh, of creatinine and um, how the kidneys clear it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on how, how you would explain this to the medical student who's trying to make the decision for how to approach this for a patient? Well, I'd like to weigh in with Dr. Grubbs. I, you know, I generally agree with the same approach and I generally use the same exact approach with talking about kidney function. Um, but I also make sure that the, the trainees are aware that the estimating equation is based on measured GFR. And the measured GFR is done by iothalamate or iothexol. It's not a perfect science. It's not an inulin clearance. You know, we don't exactly uh, have a gold standard that is exactly perfect to estimate the exact, to know what the exact kidney function is for any one individual. So for me, you know, the estimating, estimated GFR is based on a measured GFR that's also estimated. So it's an estimate of an estimate. Uh, and so definitely the dialogue about the inclusion of all of the coefficients and the, the issues and the flaws with the equations themselves, including the use of race, um, are important and should be brought up in, um, as quickly as we can with our trainees to talk about, uh, have this dialogue about how to critically, critically examine this and put this in perspective. Um, I do think that um, there is more, like I said, there is more to having a dialogue about kidney function estimation and kidney function decline than looking at an EGFR and saying, oh, this person's EGFR is 20, you gotta start dialysis. You know, we have someone in front of you, you know, who may be feeling fine and may not necessarily fit that box that you're thinking about. And, you know, it's really critically important for us to use medicine as what we know as a guide rather than an absolute. Okay. If I could just oh, add oh. that, um, uh, you know, uh, I think the underlying point here is that race, the inclusion of race gives us this perception that we're somehow getting more precise and more helpful for this group of people when it, it really isn't doing that at all. And, uh, you know, that the actual, the measured GFR might be somewhere 30% uh, higher and 30% lower than um, the uh, estimated GFR. It, I think we're really doing a disservice um, to our, our trainees to, by teaching them that you're losing something, that you're doing something wrong if you don't uh, consider the race of the person. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Dr. Adler? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on this point about precision. Um, um, Drs. Grubbs and Delgado uh, are sp uh, speaking in many ways as, as experts in kidney disease, but most of the uh, creatinines and EGFRs are interpreted by uh, non-experts in kidney disease. And so one of the goals of the change at UCSF Health was to increase the feelings of uncertainty about this test a little bit to engender more discussion, whether it's with patients or with trainees about what what the E in EGFR even means, it means estimate. And so we, we need to be more serious about the fact that this is only an estimate. And, and so that other factors um, uh, that have been described many times can be considered, including by the way, the use of cystatin C. So just um, wanted to mention that that was one of the goals we were trying to achieve was, was to was to increase at least consideration for the use of cystatin C. And we've seen about a threefold increase in the use of cystatin C since uh, mm -hmm. making the change here. So it has, now whether it, the clinical decisions are correct based on those uses, we don't know yet, um, but certainly there is more, um, there's more seeking for clarity, I think, as a result of this. Great, Dr. Richmond, did you have something? Yeah. I did. Um, thank you. I, so I just I just wanted to, if you would allow me to, to just reframe and speak to the, your question more specifically, um, Dr. Domingo, around education. And, and I, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to students and trainees um, who have been on the front lines of this issue. Um, I want to be careful to understand that there is very... Um, one, one of the reasons why we are having this discussion, this series, and one of the reasons why this movement has taken sort of national uh, um, visibility is because medical students and trainees um, who are the ones that are supposed to be being educated 
are the ones who have called this into question to begin with. They are the ones who are oftentimes having to figure out how to strategically teach up and ask these critical questions um, that have sort of historically locked us into this space of structuralized racism in medicine. They're the ones that are trying to figure out, okay, how do I exist in this space, exhausted every day with this, you know, confronted with this onslaught of microaggressions every single day, which, you know, GFR may in fact be one of them, and say, okay, I want to bring this up to my attending. Um, I want to question this. And then, you know, they get essentially smack down and you know that's just the way it is this is what the evidence shows so i just want to be careful to remember that um part of um our change and evolution on this is realizing that teaching comes from all directions um and so um you know the question could equally be asked, you know, what are the ways in which medical students can be invited to teach up to their attendings? What are the ways in which they can be heard? What are the ways in which um, this can be more well received in these um, discussions, which, which complicate and, and interrupt white supremacy as usual, um, can be welcomed into the academic space? Um, I don't know where we would be in this space um, right now without, for example, um, students at the Institute of, of um, Healing and Justice and Medicine who have, who have led this discussion nationally, um, who have uh, essentially taught and um, uh, um, done so much in instruction and invitation on organizing um, and helped you know, lead the way for you know, folks at University of Washington or Vanderbilt or uh, MGH. You know, but there's just been so much work that has been done on the ground level that has been essentially unheard, quieted, unspoken, while you know, administrators and, and institutions have, have looked as the vanguards in this space around um, sort of leading change. So I just wanted to uh, give a big shout out to the, the uh, medical students and trainees who are, who are really doing the work on the ground. Thank you, Dr. Richmond. Uh, Dr. Poe, would you comment too on um, uh, teaching the medical student who's shadowing you on clinic or on the wards? Sure. And I would do this for anything. I would say, what clinical decision are you trying to solve? Okay. And once we honed in on that, then we should use the evidence to help guide us. And let me give, let me give an example. So in this case, if, I, if I'm trying to think about how to dose a drug, let's say chemotherapy for a black woman with ovarian cancer. I picked that because it's been shown that black women are less likely to receive adequate doses of carboplatin therapy. That's been very demonstrated. So if I give them the black, the, the non-black uh, EGFR, then they that will just exacerbate that. And already it's exacerbated because we use non-indexed GFR often to dose drugs when we should be uh, well, we use index GFR rather than non-index GFR. We know that many African uh, American women are overweight or obese, which adds to the problem of inadequate dosing. Okay, that, um, so this just exacerbates the undertreatment. And then, if you go to transplant waitlisting, okay, one of the fallacies here is the problem is we make use of these thresholds. So EGFR, less than 20, that's the trigger for a referral. What if we turn, that's what I call equality. What if we turn this around and said equity? Then you would say, because African-Americans progress faster, they have a greater need. And it's need that we want to get at. Then you would get rid of that equality threshold and you would allow, give African-Americans and I have to say other racial minorities, uh, what they need. So we are fixated on these numbers and these you know, algorithms that we need to think and restructure even the way that we allocate resources and how we do that. You know, when it comes to giving someone a drug, I want to be as careful as I can. Because um, that could be a life or, or a death decision. Um, so could getting a transplant. 
but I have a little bit more time to think about that. And what's great at, at UCSF Health is, is the, you get two values. You can use either of those values for, you know, to put people over that threshold if, if, they're, at the th if, they're, if they're borderline on the threshold. And I think that's what people are speaking to about the uncertainty and then how we use the data. So that's what I would, I would teach the medical student to be the advocate for their patient, okay? Both on the access side, but also on the biology side of, of, and the medical side about how to best treat the patient. That's what it's all about. And it's not, it's not just a trigger, it's thinking about it. Thinking about the patient, as Dr. Delgado said, all the issues that you think about in making a specific clinical decision. So thank you, thank you very much. This has been a, a, a really uh, a ter terrific panel. I really appreciate uh, both Dr. Poe and Dr. Grubbs laying out the, the important issues here as well as the discussion of what this means um, for how we take care of patients, how in our systems we make decisions for how we um, and uh, do the best for, for all of our patients. And uh, I'm already hearing comments, wonderful comments from, um, from people with additional questions, but also appreciating this dialogue. Thank you very much to all of the panelists. We're gonna take a brief break now and resume at 9.40. We're now going to turn to our last case study. Um, and this is going to begin with a video followed by two flash talks uh, uh, given by uh, Professor Ryan Hernandez, who is an associate professor of bioengineering in uh, the UCSF uh, School of Medicine and School of Pharmacy. Um, he's a population geneticist that will be followed by a Dr. Alad Ziv, who is a professor of medicine, a general internist, and uh, uh, physician scientists studying cancer genetics. This will be followed by a panel a discussion when our two flash uh, talk speakers um, will uh, join a panel moderated by a Dr. Uh, professor Amy Medeiros, who is Associate Professor of History of Health Sciences in the UCSF uh, School of Medicine and a member of our steering committee for uh, this session. Uh, Dr. She'll be joined by uh, Dr. Uh, Denise Connor, who is uh, um, a physician and educator at uh, UCSF and leads our anti-oppression curriculum. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shavita Dasgupta, who is a, um, a professor and assistant dean at Boston University, geneticist and uh, educator. And uh, uh, Dr. Um, Alex Reykjavik, um, who is the Chief Genomics Officer at UCSF. So um, we'll begin with the video. Polygenic risk scores are numbers used to estimate the effect of many genetic variants on an individual's risk for disease. They are used to predict the risk of complex diseases, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, and diabetes, which are caused by an interplay of environmental and behavioral factors with the particular genetic variants that a person inherited. Polygenic risk scores have been shown to predict the risk of some chronic diseases more accurately than current clinical models. However, Polygenic risk scores currently have far greater predictive value in individuals of European descent than groups with other ancestries, which presents a major challenge to equitable implementation of precision medicine. Here, we show an example from breast cancer. Thousands of individuals' genomes were analyzed for genetic variants associated with breast cancer. They were then stratified into percentiles based on the number of risk variants they had. From this data, we could estimate the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer tailored to an individual's particular genetic makeup. So, how do polygenic risk scores work? Each of us has a genome composed of approximately 3 billion nucleotide base pairs, or the letters of DNA, that spell out about 20,000 genes and shape who we are. But the vast majority of our genomes are identical. 
only about 0.1% of the base pairs in our genomes differ among individuals. And these variants are referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. These SNPs account for the genetic differences among us, such as eye color, height, and even our risk for certain diseases. Most of the SNPs in an individual's genome are shared across all human populations. But due to our unique patterns of human migration and ancestry, some of them are found more commonly in one population, while others are rare and only ever found in a particular population. SNPs that are close together on a chromosome are often inherited together in a block. So even though the SNP we actually detect might not be causing the variation we see, we can predict it will be inherited along with the causal SNP. SNPs can be easily detected at a very low cost by a process called genotyping. This has allowed us to analyze SNPs for millions of people to look for associations between these SNPs and whether or not people have certain diseases, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. This type of study is called a genome-wide association study. For complex diseases, individual SNPs often contribute only a tiny increased risk of disease. However, some people carry many disease-associated SNPs and may have elevated genetic risk for that disease. This is the idea behind polygenic risk scores. We can estimate a person's risk of disease by summing up all the genetic risk factors they carry in their genome. So, how well do polygenic risk scores work across different populations? Well, polygenic risk scores derived from one global population typically perform much worse in other populations. For example, one study found that polygenic risk scores based on study participants from Japan were less accurate when applied to British people of European or African ancestry, and vice versa. There are many possible reasons for this. First, SNPs and inheritance blocks can differ significantly between populations based on their genetic history. So, if we want to estimate genetic risk for a disease in a different population, we need to study that population directly. Second, differences in behavior and the environment across populations can affect how predictive genetic variants are in determining disease risk. But what is a population? Globally, humans form a continuum of genetic ancestry connecting all of us from our evolutionary origins in Africa through waves of migration spreading across the world. Race and ethnicity are social constructs that seek to simplify the complex relationships among all humans on the basis of physical characteristics and cultural heritage, respectively. In contrast, genetic ancestry is a measure of similarity among individuals based on their genetic variants and is most closely related to the geographic origins of the individual's ancestors. Race and ethnicity can be correlated to genetic ancestry, but they are not the same. Therefore, race and ethnicity are better predictors of social determinants of health, such as exposure to racism, while ancestry is a better predictor of genotype. Unfortunately, the human genetics community has not done a great job of studying the continuum of human populations. Approximately 80% of all genome-wide association study participants are of European descent, despite making up only 16% of the global population. From a genetic perspective, that means we're missing a lot of the global genetic variation. And from a healthcare perspective, we run the risk of exacerbating health disparities. This is because the polygenic risk scores we derive are less accurate in underrepresented populations, and thus the benefits are not evenly distributed. To fix this, we need to include populations of diverse ancestries. However, because genetic ancestry is determined by genotyping, we first need to recruit people based on self-defined social constructs of race and ethnicity as proxies for underlying genetic variation. Thus, to improve diversity in genetic ancestry, studies need to improve racial and ethnic diversity. When we do so, we can improve polygenic risk scores for everyone. For example, the inclusion of a large number of men of African ancestry in a recent study improved the precision of polygenic risk scores for predicting prostate cancer risk in both European and African populations. Moving forward, we need to prioritize the inclusion of diverse populations in genomic research and to better understand the impact of environmental factors. 
These steps will improve the value of polygenic risk scores for non-European populations and advance equity in genomic health for all. Excellent. Dr. Hernandez? Wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to talk today a little bit um, uh, uh, about the basic science of thinking about race, ethnicity, and ancestry um, coming at, uh, at this perspective, at this from a, um, a population genetics perspective. Um, and my real interest is in understanding the phenotypic variation that we see across the world. Um, there is a tremendous amount of phenotypic variation within the global human population. And it's uh, largely thought that much of this phenotypic variation has to do with our evolutionary history. As a species, we evolved within Africa uh, some 200,000 years ago, and over the last several thousand years have uh, finally colonized the entire world. Um, and what's amazing about this is that it's only within the last 10 to 15,000 years that humans have been the only homo species on earth. Um, throughout our evolutionary history, there have been many homo species that have coexisted, um, but only within the last 10,000, 10 to 15,000 years have, uh, have we become the only homo species. And, um, and that's remarkable. Um, and it owes to, uh, to thinking about how we consider humans as a species and as a population. But as humans have migrated across the population, not necessarily everybody has moved from one location to another, obviously, but many people stay behind. Um, the way we can think about how those migrations and movements across the world affect human populations and the genetics, um, uh, genetic patterns we see in different human populations, um, I like to think about human genetics as, um, as, uh, as an urn uh, full of a bunch of different genetic variants. Right? This is, you can imagine this is a, a population of genomes, um, and each of these different colored balls represent different patterns of genetic variation. If only a small number of people move from one location in the world um, to another, it's like taking a small sample of the genetic variation that exists in that prior, that prior uh, population. And so what we end up with is a small number of individuals representing just a small fraction of the genetic variation that existed in the, um, in the previous population. But of course that population typically grows, right? They find a new niche, they find a new environment that they can thrive in, uh, new resources that they can access, uh, and that population grows. But when that population grows, the genetic diversity within that population grows slowly. Um, all mutations that enter, enter in as very rare variants within a population, and it takes a long time for those mutations to increase in frequency. And so what we see is that in a new population, the genetic variation is a subset of the genetic variation that existed in the previous population. And you can imagine as, the, as humans evolved within Africa and slowly spread and radiated across the world, this resulted in a series of these uh, processes occurring. These processes are called bottlenecks, population bottlenecks, where populations go through sort of a reduction in population size, uh, but then expand again to a, to a much larger population size later. And this process has resulted in patterns of genetic variation that are quite different um, in, in different regions of the world. Um, this is a plot looking at, um, at 2,500 individuals from the 1,000 Genomes Project that was published a number of years ago, um, where we're looking at the number of variant sites per genome, right? And each one of these little points is an individual from a different population, uh, from a different country or a different sampling location. Um, and what we see is that in Africa, in uh, many different individuals from uh, different populations in Africa, there tends to be 4.6 to about 5 million variants per individual genome. But if we look at non-African populations, it tends to be much lower, uh, between four and 4.2 million variants per, uh, per individual. <clears throat> and so with, given all of this data, given these millions of variants um, and the different patterns that we see across different, um, different number of variants that we see across different populations and different combinations that we see across different populations, it turns out that we can use this information um, across the genome to stratify different population groups, right? And so if we take a sample of individuals from a European population, this is a group of individuals from a sample, European ancestry individuals from Utah. Um, if we take a group of individuals sampled from uh, Nigeria, if we take a group of individuals um, that are identified as, as, as Native American, um, and we look across the genomes, we can use modern tools so, such as principal component analysis, which is what this represents, to identify different clusters of human populations. 
Um, but of course, this is a simplistic view of what po uh, populations look like in the United States. In the United States, we are uh, we have populations that are characterized by a uh, the forced migration um, of individuals from Africa and the colonization of the U United States and the, the Americas by individuals from from Europe. Um, which has resulted in an extensive amount of admixture amongst many different populations. And when we look at, at populations that are sampled within the United States or within the Americas, um, what we see is that the number of genetic variants in these populations from, uh, from Peru, Colombia, from Puerto Rico, from um, African-Americans from the Southwest, what we see is a very wide range in the number of genetic variants per genome. And this largely reflects the different ancestries that these individuals um, have within their genomes. Um, and so the way that this works is you can imagine that there's two individuals, uh, an individual from one um, uh, population from one region of the world and another individual from a different population from a different region of the world. Um, and if they mate and have an offspring, individual from population one will provide a red chromosome to their offspring and individual from population two will provide a blue uh, chromosome. But if we have mating uh, within individuals that are, um, uh, that are admixed, then they don't pass on an entire red or blue chromosome anymore. They pass on a recombinant uh, chromosome, um, which will be partially red and partially blue. And as this process continues over time, what we end up with is a mosaic of genomes. Just an example, I'll show you one. This is me, this is my genome from 23andMe. Um, and what you can see is that um, um, my ancestry is roughly 70%, 71% European, about 20 and a half percent Native American or Amer Indigenous, as I, like to, as I prefer to refer to it, um, and about 3.6% uh, Sub-Saharan African. And these are distributed across my entire genome. Um, <clears throat> And when we look across populations of the US, this admixture process has actually resulted in a continuum of populations. We don't have discrete groups uh, that, uh, that represent just one population. All of our different population groups are connected um, through individuals that have varying degrees of ancestry uh, from European, African, and Amer indigenous sources, as well as other Asian sources. And it turns out that a lot of these um, ancestry patterns are correlated with biomedical traits. Um, so we've looked within Mexican Americans in this particular study at how much a, the uh, biomedical trait is correlated with, uh, with ancestry patterns. In this case, looking specifically at the degree to which an individual's um, Amer indigenous ancestry varies. And what we find is that there's some dramatic correlations ranging from, uh, from height uh, which is very negatively correlated with Amer indigenous ancestry. The more Amer indigenous ancestry you contain in your genome, uh, the shorter you tend to be on average. Um, all the way up to positively correlated factors, um, such as, uh, as, our, as our friend that we've been discussing this morning, EGFR. Um, and what we notice then is that if ancestry is correlated with biomedical traits, then this is potentially something that we really need to access if we're going to think about the care of individuals in our society. Um, and just to think about the consequences of, of this kind of idea where we have a, um, a, a human genetics um, and, and clinical operation that has been largely, and biomedical research operation that's been largely biased towards sampling individuals of European ancestry, um, I wanted to look specifically at the case of height, right? Height is one of the simplest phenotypes to collect. It, everybody has one, um, and it's very easy to, to access. Um, and there are very large samples that have been studied, um, 300,000 plus individuals from the UK Biobank, for example, um, in, in, uh, with individuals of European ancestry. Um, and we've developed polygenic risk scores or polygenic height scores that, um, that we can use based on these European individuals and ask how well do they apply in other, different, uh, other populations. We applied it to Mexican Americans in particular, and we asked how well does this polygenic height score work? Well, it turns out for individuals that are Mexican Americans that have very high levels of European ancestry or very low levels of Amer indigenous ancestry, it actually works quite well. The correlation between their predicted height score um, and their actual height um, is highly correlated, p-value of 10 to the minus five. However, if you take individuals in the upper quartile for Amer indigenous ancestry or lower quartile for European ancestry, it doesn't work well at all. Um, we have p-values that are greater than 0.08. And in fact, for this other um, quartile, it's a p-value of 0.6. Um, it just really does not correlate with, um, the predicted height does not correlate with um, observed height at all. 
And so what we have in the United States is that admixture has produced a continuum of populations and race and ethnicity are, are really imperfect partitions of this continuum. Um, and it's, it's, it's important to, to point out that more information is actually needed on family history to overcome the systemic underrepresentation of historically excluded groups. Um, and it's important to note that this idea of identifying individuals as white or black or African-American or Hispanic Latina is, 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 is somewhat challenging because all of the individuals that were included this, in the study are from the, his, um, the Hispanic health studies. Um, and all of these individuals have identified, self-identified as Hispanic Latino some of whom have very high African ancestry, some of whom have very high and indigenous ancestry, some of whom have very high European ancestry, but all of these individuals self-identify as Hispanic Latina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zip. Hi, can you see my uh, screen? Yep. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to try and frame this in a uh, little bit more um, kind of clinical um, domain and ask the question of sort of how do we use, how could we use polygenic risk scores and how does that intersect uh, with uh, race and with ancestry? And I'm going to be particularly focusing on the example of polygenic risk score for breast cancer. Um, so um, it was already uh, introduced in the uh, video, in the introductory video, that um, polygenic risk for breast cancer has been developed. Um, and in fact, uh, this slide uh, demonstrates the lifetime risk, estimated lifetime risk for uh, women with different polygenic risk score, where the top line, uh, the orange line, represents the top one percentile of polygenic risk. Um, and this was a paper uh, present, uh, published by the Breast Cancer Association Consortium. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what uh, this, uh, what we didn't say is that uh, this is a paper done by European consortium actually, and all of the samples included here are, are European ancestry. Um, and so the question then is, how do we use this in clinical practice? Um, so one of the ways that we could potentially use in clinical practice is sort of thinking about the onset of screening. So for example, uh, this is uh, a study done by, the, by a UK group. And so they um, start in the UK, uh, screening starts at age 50. Um, and the average 10-year risk, um, so this slide demonstrates the 10-year risk by the percentile of polygenic risk scores. The average 10-year uh, risk um, is for a 50 year old woman is about two and a half uh, percent. Um, so, um, and you can see that the, the middle line, uh, the blue line there crosses the threshold at, at two and a half percent. But what um, you can also see is that there are lots of women based on their polygenic risk score who cross that line uh, much earlier. For example, uh, in the 60th to 80th percentile, there are women crossing that uh, threshold on average at age 43. Um, and the top one percentile crosses, um, by the time they're actually age 40, uh, which is when we begin to think about screening even in the United States, um, those women are actually up at about 6% uh, uh, risk. So you can think that this uh, potentially makes sense to at least consider uh, in the context of screening. Um, now I do wanna say, and this, is there, this has generated a lot of enthusiasm uh, from uh, some geneticists and possibly some clinicians. Um, I do want to, I think, caution that uh, we, this is sort of all uh, an idea. Um, we haven't really used this. We haven't really shown that it's effective. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the WISDOM trial, which is a, a one example of how polygenic risk score is being used. So uh, the WISDOM trial is a trial of breast cancer screening. And this it's really a comparison of standard screening, which we the trial defines as uh, annual mammography starting at age 40. Uh, that is the guideline recommendations by the American College of Radiology and some other uh, 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 institutions. And uh, the comparison group is what um, is being called the precision or personalized screening arm in the WISDOM trial. And that 
uh, arm includes a genetic mutation uh, panel testing. So they test for nine uh, breast cancer susceptibility genes. Um, and then uh, women who are women who are positive then get um, uh, shuffled over to uh, a high risk uh, screening regimen that includes uh, mammography and MRI uh, every year. Um, and uh, women who uh, either have intermediate uh, penetrance genes, ATM and CHECK2, or uh, women who don't who test negative then uh, go into a larger uh, group and um, are risk stratified, uh, get a, uh, a, polygen a polygenic risk model as well as a uh, risk model for um, calculated by the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium model and uh, get put into bins uh, with some of them, the lowest risk women starting uh, mammography at age 50, uh, and then um, intermediate risk women starting at age uh, uh, in their 40s and getting mammography every year, uh, higher risk women uh, getting uh, mammography every year, uh, and then the highest risk women getting uh, mammogram and MRI um, uh, every year. So, um, so that's the idea. And as, as you can see, polygenic risk is part of that. Um, and so um, this is an example of, I think, where we're, we're using this today in, in a clinical trial setting. Uh, we don't know the answer yet, um, but should this work, then what we would like to do is take this polygenic risk and apply it in the clinic. And the question is, can we? And as I think some of the other speakers have already uh, hinted, it's not going to be straightforward uh, based um, on ancestry. Um, I just want to say one other thing is that actually in the uh, clinical domain, some companies are now returning polygenic risk scores. Um, so these are two companies, uh, uh, two of the larger genetic testing companies, and they test for uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and CHECK2, other susceptibility genes. If you come back negative, they offer these breast cancer polygenic risk scores. They, re they are returned. Um, but there's a catch. The catch is you have to be a certain age. Uh, they're returned only to women. Um, and um, they say explicitly on their websites that they only return the results if you are a certain ancestry. They particularly say European um, ancestry. One of them says Ashkenazi Jewish. <laughs> One of them says non-Ashkenazi Jewish. But the, the, the bottom line here is that a large fraction of the population uh, of the US population is not getting the results back. Um, and the question here is, um, you know, what's happening? Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the one thing I, I wanna say is, you know, we've talked a lot about um, sort of disparities and um, uh, kind of uh, the goal of making uh, medicine uh, more equitable. Well, here is an example of where we've actually introduced a disparity. Um, and uh, let me sort of take you through a little bit more of the evidence. Um, I think in some ways, this is perhaps they've been overly restrictive, uh, but the data have probably lagged um, and they're just coming in now. Um, so this is, these are some of the data. Um, this is actually uh, compiled, as you can see, from um, four different papers. The uh, 2019 paper um, by Mavidat was the uh, breast, the polygenic risk score in the European ancestry populations. And then um, our own paper um, uh, by, led by Yue She and Lara Feherman uh, on polygenic risk score in Latinas, uh, a polygenic risk score in Asians uh, by Ho et al and a polygenic risk score in African uh, Americans uh, and other African ancestry populations uh, was just published uh, by Du et al. Um, and this is sort of compiling all of the results and you can see on um, the um, x-axis are the percentile of uh, polygenic risk score. On the y-axis are the odds ratios. And so what you wanna see is sort of a spread. Um, you wanna see that the highest risk women are at the highest risk and at the, lo that the lowest, lowest risk women are at the lowest risk. Um, and what, um, what you're seeing is that, is that it does work, um, but um, that it works deferentially. And in particular, um, what we're seeing is that um, if we just uh, take this uh, top, the 95 to 99 percentile group, um, the 
po the polygenic risk score in the European ancestry uh, women is about two and a half fold higher uh, risk compared to the median. Um, in Asian populations, it's uh, 2.2. In Latinas, it's about 2.2. And in the African ancestry population, it's about 1.6. So um, uh, half of the predictive power has been lost. And um, this may be sort of what's been, what's been uh, driving this deferential um, uh, reporting on the part of uh, the companies. Um, uh, and and the, the next question is sort of how did we get here? Um, well, um, so um, this is sort of the largest uh, genome-wide association studies. And um, you can see this is actually taken from uh, the NCI website. They're actually large, running a, a new genome-wide association study. And you can see the existing genome-wide association data um, in the kind of middle panel here. And um, what you can see is that, um, you know, we're, we've basically been uh, systematically underrepresenting uh, the Black or African-American women also the Asian and Latina women um, compared to the, to the European ancestry population. So 144,000 cases have been uh, GWAST, whereas um, in the Asian, it's 14,000. African-American, it's been uh, about 16,000. I should say these are data that are um, existing. They haven't quite been published. So um, they're, they're probably, uh, things will get better probably in the near future in uh, the African-American population. Um, and, and even lower uh, sample size in Latinas. Uh, and actually, I, I should add that there are other populations that have really been dramatically uh, underrepresented here. Um, and so I think, you know, we're asking the genetics to do, um, uh, to, we, we, the assumption perhaps was that the, um, it'll just work re regardless of your uh, ancestry. Um, and the, um, result is clearly that it's not. Um, there, it's not working. Um, it, it's work. It's working a little bit, um, a little better than 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 not at all. But um, we're losing a lot of information, um, and this could have um, implications uh, for the way precision medicine is ultimately applied in different populations. So I think um, the kind of take home messages I, I want to. Um, impress on you is that um, we need to be aware of the differences between ancestry and race um, when we analyze studies. Uh, and certainly in the clinical domain, we really need to think about that. Uh, but we also need to use race to recruit participants because we need diverse ancestry and genetic uh, uh, studies. Uh, if we don't do that, we run the race that the genetic results that we get will not work well across ancestry groups, uh, which will predominantly affect minority populations. Uh, and in my view, that leads to a structural, uh, form of structural racism in the sense that the precision medicine tools that we're developing that are being paid for by public funds, uh, for the most part, um, by taxpayers, um, are not uh, going to work well across populations. And I'll stop there. Great, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I now wanna invite our panelists to come and just to make a comment that we've chosen both of these case studies today because they represent um, tools that uh, EGFR and polygenic risk scores, diagnostic tools that um, we are um, either actively using and have used for many years or are they're on the brink of uh, potentially being used clinically and both pose um, uh, raise, issues related to how we should think about race, racism in medicine and uh, the application or the, the knowledge base that underlies them and the application in clinical practice. So looking forward to the discussion uh, and uh, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Medeiros. Thank you so much. Um, before I turn it to the panelists to give some of their initial feedback, I'd like to provide a little historical context as a historian of medicine. Yesterday, I was reminded by Dr. Denise Davis that history is present. Not only am I compelled to thank Dr. Davis for this reminder, but I would also like to use it as a possible framework for our discussion today about the use of genetic ancestry in medical research and healthcare. In doing so, I'd like to re refer back to Dr. Grubb's comments about the history and legacy of eugenics and medicine. 
Eugenics is the practice of or advocacy for selective breeding to advance society by championing the reproduction of the fit and eliminating the unfit. The fit category was often seen along racial lines. Elite whites were deemed desirable and poor whites, the disabled and people of color were not. In the US, one of the most influential eugenicists was Charles Davenport, a prominent early 20th century biologist. In the 1900s, he became the director of the biological laboratory of Cold Spring, at Cold Spring Harbor, where he oversaw the collection of data and quote unquote, inheritable traits by field workers. While there are fundamental differences between the collection and, and processing of data by eugenicists then and geneticists and medical researchers now, this history is present with us. Also present with us is the history of appropriation. From the taking of native, native people land to the extracting of information from black and brown bodies in the name of medical advancement. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Romatash Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Romatash Ohlone elders, past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF hospitals, research laboratories, and classrooms occupy, their home. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge a few individuals who were sacrificed for the advancement of medicine. These include Carter Howard, Frederick Moss, and the black men who were subjects of the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the quote unquote Negro male. Also Elmer Allen, a black Pullman porter living in Richmond, California, who in 1947, he had a continuous um, painful knee. He decided to attend a free clinic ran by, the UCS, by UCSF. There, he was injected with plutonium and later had his leg amputated. And Henrietta Lacks, the 30-year-old um, African-American woman whose cells continue to promote our collective immortality. I'd also like to contribute to our discussion today by not only um, uh, making this reference that history is present, but the present is also present. It has been almost one year when videos made by witnesses and security cameras of George Floyd's murder became public. While this type of treatment is not new, the footage extended the visibility of police brutality killing Black Americans beyond red line communities and into spaces populated by people who have benefited from residential segregation. As the 1964 movie, Nothing But a Man, brought the lens of a Black man's experience in America's apartheid um, to, to viewers, so did the cell phone recordings of George Floyd's murder. Today, as we are turning into this panel discussion, Millions of Americans are turning into the trial of one of the police officers charged with this murder. We discuss race and racism in medicine within this context. And finally, I'd like to suggest that medical research is a social activity that is carried out through a coordinated network of scientists who are influenced by many things, including the sociological concept of race. Race as a social construct is a concept that has been molded by racism and the persistent delusion of white supremacy. As Tanahisi Coates reminds us, race is the child of racism, not the father. I'm hoping this framework might help us in making sense of unfair practices in genetic research and healthcare, including the disproportionate data collection practices in genome-wide association studies, which privileges the population of European descent. This type of white framing in research is often operationalized automatically, leaving many stunned when its presence is revealed, often by researchers who are considered outside of the respective scientific fields read outsiders in this case as to be sociologists, anthropologists, and historians. So like most of you joining us today, I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists. And I would like to get started in um, hearing some of the initial responses from the uh, presentations that we heard from Dr. Siv and Dr. Hernandez, and also to hear a little bit about the video and some of the reactions to that. So um, what we've been doing in the past in the other sessions is that we've just been starting by calling upon certain um, panelists. And um, I'm going to do so now kind of like a popcorn, not a popcorn format, but in a moderation format. Um, I will start with uh, Dr. Connor. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me again today. I hope I can offer some um, perspective um, coming from medical education in this conversation. Um, I wanted to just echo something that um, Amy just discussed, which has to do with um, the risk of talking about these topics with our learners in an ahistorical way. Um, and the way that we lose credibility and we break trust with learners when we do that. I love Stephen Richmond's point that teaching comes in all directions. And in many ways, our students have been leading the way in these conversations so far. And because of that, because students have had to do their own discovery of the 
um, the history of racism in medicine and bring that to faculty, there is already a sense of distrust when faculty then want to talk with students about things that are steeped in that history. So I think the a really key lesson that we all need to really um, think about is when these issues are so tightly linked with sort of real intergenerational trauma, present day trauma, it's our obligation to own up to that racist history um, when we talk about these things. Um, and that before we can move forward with talking about genetics, we need to acknowledge where that, where that history is and where that history should be in this conversation. And then once we do that, I think we can then begin to have conversations about um, restorative justice and how can we salvage what's good in genetics and um, in an effort to get towards equity in healthcare. So I just wanted to sort of echo, echo that point. Thank you. Dr. Dasgupta. Thank you again for including me in this very important conversation. I just wanted to refer back to a very important point emphasized by both uh, Drs. Hernandez and Ziv about the absolute necessity of having diversity in genetic studies in order to be able to reap the benefit of these developments for populations across the world. Um, but also hearkening back to Dr. Medeiros' comments about history, um, geneticists have not always done good in this space. One story that we can think about has to do with the Havasupai indigenous peoples hearkening from the deep areas of the Grand Canyon and their agreement with local researchers to be able to study the genetic basis of diabetes in the community. And then those researchers going on to do further studies once they had the DNA in hand, um, looking at things like the genetic basis of schizophrenia without explicit permission of the tribal members. And this just highlights the absolute necessity of you know, partnering properly with people who are participating in this research. So there's this um, saying that's often used, which I think is quite relevant in this context, which is not about us without us. And I think that that's a really important concept to think about in this context. Thank you. Dr. Govich. Uh, hi, good morning, and uh, thank you for letting me participate in this. Uh, I would like to actually congratulate Elad, Ryan, and Matt for putting uh, a great population genetics uh, primer uh, that actually was very, very clear. Um, as a clinical geneticist, uh, I'm not a population genetist. Clinical geneticists, we usually look at Mendelian genetics, meaning rare diseases in, that present either in pediatric populations prenatally or in the adulthood. Um, and uh, usually um, American College of Medical Genetics and, and their guidelines um, uh, that are currently used to interpret uh, these uh, uh, genetic sequencing is actually relatively uh, population race and is diagnostic. Um, however, it does actually influence our ability to interpret even these results uh, because uh, we don't have, we don't understand the genetic architecture of all the populations across the world. And there have been several situations where a family from uh, Middle East or from um, Southeastern Asia presents with a disorder and a laboratory says, we don't know how to interpret these genetic variants, but clearly these variants are causing the disease. But because we don't have a good information on the, the, in our databases of what the genetic variation is, I have to put on my clinical hat and overrule the laboratory and says these variation actually does cause a disease in this individual. Um, some groups have embraced genetics very well. Um, so we know that uh, 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 a lot of the Ashkenazi Jews have embraced carrier screening um, and have been really, um, uh, they have really pushed carrier screening in their populations because they are at risk for certain diseases given uh, their uh, population structures. Um, and um, I, I think that in many ways, they have used genetics as a way to better the outcomes of their care. Other groups, uh, unfortunately, because of the history of racism, uh, do not want to use genetics and, and approach it with disdain and distrust. And I think that, um, uh, uh, you know, these are the issues uh, in terms of participation in our studies, uh, increasing diversity uh, are the barriers that uh, we are actually faced as researchers and also as clinicians where we try to use genetics uh, in diverse populations and especially in populations where uh, history of 
genetics, in, uh, explaining inferiority and superiority, utilizing those tools to try to somehow explain socioeconomic uh, and structural racism differences in terms of biology uh, have actually, unfortunately, are backfiring. Uh, this history is backfiring because as we see the participation uh, in research, uh, uh, especially among minority groups is lagging behind the white populations. And in part, this is also due to the lack of infrastructure across the world. Um, I, I'm happy to see that there are now over 40 countries that are trying to sequence part of their populations for us to better understand the diversity. Um, uh, there is also the uh, Human Heredity and Health Project that is ongoing in Africa, uh, that is run by Africans and enabled by United States and Europe to try to increase diversity and better understanding of African populations, because after all, we all came out of Africa. Uh, and we are much less diverse than the African populations are. And so this is all actually uh, moving, I think, in the, in the right direction. But the important problem to maintain is data sharing, because if you're going to use ancestry uh, in our um, medical records and in refining uh, individuals' geography, we need to have access to all the diverse data that is sitting in national or other data banks. Uh, and so these are some of the uh, barriers that will have to be um, uh, that will have to be overcome if you're going to fully utilize uh, the studies that are ongoing across the world. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, I'd like to take some of the remarks that we just had and connect them to the presentation through a question. Um, ancestry is a genetic tool and is a continuous measure, according to Dr. Hernandez. Um, but in the presentations, both speakers created categories of ancestry that seemed to sometimes mean self-reported race, and sometimes it meant most dominant genetic ancestry grouping. I'm wondering if there's a way in which we can reconcile, reconcile this. I'll start with Dr. Hernandez. Um, it's a great point. Um, you know, I think that there is, um, th there are, um, some challenges that people um, perceive when thinking of continuous or quantitative measures um, such as ancestry. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's just perceived as easier to think about these dichotomous um, categories in certain types of analyses. Um, when some of us see potential challenges, others of us see opportunity. Um, and I think that um, that the, dis the, the decision to, to think about race and ethnicity as, a, as, as sort of these discrete categories um, versus ancestry really boils down to the types of questions that you're trying to ask um, and the, um, the ability to integrate people who are, um, are able to think about the, um, the, um, the ways in which we can sort of leverage the information um, that's contained within the genome um, to, to better use the information um, than, um, than simple dichotomous categories. Um, you know, the, the, the use of race and ethnicity is a, a, has, a, um, has a very fraught history, um, but, um, but as, uh, as Dr. Ziv has suggested, there's, um, there is value in, in using that as a, as a prior mechanism to get people involved in studies that are underrepresented, that have been historically excluded uh, from studies. Um, because we don't have genetic information on everybody, um, and until we do, it's hard to access um, individuals who are, have been historically excluded uh, from the biomedical research infrastructure um, without that information. Um, and so, um, so I think that there are ways of, of bringing in and, and, uh, and using all of the information at hand, um, but it needs a, a concerted effort to do so. Thank you. I'm going to push this a little bit further and I'm going to use some evidence in uh, order for us to be able to uh, discuss this a little bit more specifically. Um, I'm thinking about, and I'm coming to this as a historian, right? So coming in this from the outside, um, looking in, and I was curious uh, if we had maybe even the opportunity or we could discuss a little bit about the slide, I believe it was the second to the last slide of Dr. Sis' presentation, where in which we saw that on the left-hand column, there was the, um, the heading of race slash ancestry, where actually these two terms are combined through the slash. Um, and I'm just curious, 
it, how is that or is that useful or how could this be kind of evidence towards maybe a misunderstanding of some of the discussion or also maybe a little bit about how there is concern about the conflating of these terms um, and how race and ancestry uh, are used interchangeably or actually being connected through uh, uh, added punctuation in that case. Yeah. Yeah, so if I can respond to, I think this slide was the the the, the table from the NCI website. Um, so um, I apologize to anyone who didn't like it. I'm, uh, I'm also, and, and if anyone from the NCI is listening, um, uh, <laughs> please fund me. No, just kidding. Um, uh, but um, no, I I think that. Um, so you're right. I think that there is some conflation here. Um, and in that case, I um, I'm actually not sure exactly how it was uh, sort of how that table was put together. But I guess I would say, so, okay, once we get the genetic information and in some of those studies, the genetic information is available and you can actually subset it even more. Um, I think it wasn't available perhaps to all the people putting that table together. Um, uh, but so once we get the data, it's actually relatively easy. But I think the point, um, I guess I was trying to make with taking that slide is that, it, you know, there's sort of, it was, I think at least five to one, if not 10 to one um, for some groups and even worse for other groups that, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing sort of a 10 to one data bias, it's just not, you know, you can't even start kind of uh, uh, making sort of conclusions. Um, and I think, um, I guess the point of that slide, I would say, is just to sort of like, how did we get here? And um, to start the conversation, really, how do we undo that? Um, and I think that one of the ways perhaps to undo that is, you know, to recognize that it's a problem um, and to recruit. And, and as far as I can tell, um, you need to recruit based on uh, self-identification. Uh, um, even for the purpose of enhancing ancestry, because we don't really have a sort of like ancestry, um, you know, ability to to inf infer anyone's ancestry without um, genotyping them. We can't genotype them until we recruit them. I think. I think. I mean, there's a problem with recruitment. It's a problem. I would say also that kind of has been built for decades. It wasn't like somebody went out and sort of tried to do this 10 to one or five to one sort of bias. I think it was just sort of people had like, here are the studies we have, let's run the, the arrays, you know, let's find the most genes. Um, but I think it was sort of, I would think of sort of the kind of the structural uh, racism that existed in uh, genetic studies um, for decades kind of came home to roost um, with um, the introduction of genome-wide association studies. Um, so I'll stop there. Okay, let's hear from Dr. Connor and then Dr. Dasgupta. Um, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to just add one thing. I mean, I think certainly what, what we're saying it seems like, and I agree with, is that um, the problem becomes when we are very reductionist and we um, want to use a small number of discrete categories to describe what is clearly a continuum but then the conflict of how do we get that continuum, that information. But I, I want, actually wanted to take a minute to talk about the patient here. Um, I've heard a lot about the problem and the barrier being that individuals don't know their ancestry and that therefore we need to use uh, socially, uh, social political character of their race um, instead. Um, while it may be true that people don't know their ancestry, I think actually when we talk, we talk with our patients about an ancestry as separate from their race, we can really create opportunities for personal narrative and individuation that are really important for patients. So giving people a chance to reflect on the impact of the diaspora on the loss of their family's knowledge about distant ancestry, um, for example, um, could be a very healing thing to do in the healthcare setting um, and could help us to avoid stereotyping and bias by getting to know our patients' unique family histories um, what they know and what they don't know and why they know things and why they don't know things. Sitting with our patients to learn about that, I think could be very empowering um, for patients, even though we don't yet have all the information we need to have to make clinical decisions once we know that ancestry. I actually think talking to patients about ancestry as separate from race would be quite empowering. 
If I may add on to that, the wonderful comments from Dr. Siv and Connor, I was also thinking about the impact on the individual patients and thinking about the, the question of why are we using race and ancestry in the clinical context? The real reason is that we don't have the actual risk factors identified in many cases. Is the risk factor for the disease racism? Is the risk factor exposure to environmental toxins? Or is it that variant at position 2694 on chromosome five? You know, what is it actually that is causing this increased risk that is observed in various human populations? And so race or ancestry, whichever um, flavors being used in the context of clinical care is used as a placeholder until we have better information. And so we're really in that in-between liminal space where we're trying to identify the true risk factors so that we can make more precise um, predictions about an individual's risk. Uh, the other thing I would point out is when we think about an individual's identity and how it's actually documented in somebody's um, medical record, what we need to realize is that there's so many different ways this information is documented. Sometimes it is self-reported. Sometimes you're only allowed to check one box. So you're not allowed to be admixed actually in certain record forms. Um, sometimes it's based on just being eyeballed on your way into the clinic. Um, so really there's just such a range in which this information actually enters the medical record and therefore um, clinical diagnostic reasoning. Thank you. Let's hear from Dr. Rakovich and then Dr. Hernandez. Yeah, I, I do want to reiterate the fact that, uh, you know, holistically looking at the patient and especially the family pedigree is an extremely important tool, which unfortunately is uh, not easy to, to do in a clinical setting where you have 10, 15 minutes per patient. But I would argue that family pedigree uh, can give you so much information about the background of the individual that is so unique about that particular individual. And then you can uh, hopefully then personalize your care based on that. Uh, as well, it's important, you know, any variant that you may identify that may have clinical significance needs to be put in the context of the family because it may have significantly different meanings in different families, both in terms of penetrance and, and how it's going to manifest. So again, um, I agree, a lot of what we do is reductionist, but we always have to pull ourselves out of that and, and we need to use uh, many tools before we actually label something as significant or not significant. And that's where experience and, and clinical acumen comes in in a regular clinical care. Um, so I think from that perspective, uh, uh, that, uh, that is an important piece that needs to be um, uh, held uh, uh, to account because I see it many, at many of our rounds where we, where we get stuck trying to interpret one variant and, and how it may cause this or that. And again, Th that those kind of approaches have also been used to justify uh, certain physical traits, to justify certain intellectual traits, which have been debunked by many studies that such reductionism never uh, is a total mismeasure of an individual, both, both clinically and, and otherwise. Dr. Hernandez and then Dr. Siv. I really appreciate the comments from Dr. Connor Dasgupta. I think that it's it's critical to think about what are the driving factors, um, and and whether um, whether race and ethnicity mean something in a biological context, in in the context of these studies that we're doing. If it's actually necessary to um, to use as a as a as a as a filter or as a mechanism for recruiting um, individuals with diverse ancestry. Um, and um, and these are, are are things that we need to study very deeply and think about very uh, very seriously. Um, one of the interesting components of of thinking about ancestry is that um, because it's something that we can't necessarily assess just by looking at ourselves in the mirror. Um, surprises can pop up um, and and people can identify uh, can learn they have more or less ancestry of uh, than um, than they might have expected or hoped and um, and there can be a certain amount of stigma um, in in that as well um, you know growing up as a um, as a Latino I always uh, with a my father's Mexican American my mother's white I always found myself um, too much of a Latino to fit in with my white friends and too white to fit in with my Latino friends, right? Um, this is something that I can tell just from looking at me. Um, and then it was sort of uh, verified when I did my genetic ancestry analysis and see that I have 20% Amber Indigenous ancestry, right? Um, what does that mean? What is that? What is that? How, how do I feel about myself? How do I check those boxes? Do I check the, the white box? 
Um, do I check um, other? Uh, do I check mixed? Um, you know, I have almost 4% African ancestry. What do I do with that information, right? Um, these things, as a population geneticist, uh, I finally have some sense of how I would use that information, um, but not until recently. <laughs> um, and so this is not a concept that's very easy to, um, to disseminate and to have a, a concrete discussion with people about, um, unless you have um, a, a large number of trained individuals who are capable of thinking about this. And I would love to see that be the case. I would love to have outreach um, in this regard to, to increase representation uh, from uh, from people across the spectrum of humanity. I, I really love the the, um, the quote that uh, Dr. Descoupe used, not about us without us. I think that that, is, that really captures exactly uh, what we need to do um, and why we need to spend so much effort diversifying the biomedical research workforce um, in order to make sure that these concepts are adequately addressed and included um, when we're designing these studies and when we're actually moving forward with how we um, uh, handle uh, clinical care. Dr. Zip? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I guess I wanted to also reflect on something Dr. Connor said um, about sort of the sort of personal history of, of individuals and actually also Dr. Reykjavik said about sort of the, the history of families. Um, I, I found it really um, instructive um, later in my career, or I guess the middle of my career, um, to start going to the genetic counseling, um, uh, they call a tumor genetics board, where they talk about families um, and in the context of mutations. Um, and they go, they uh, get actually a lot of history, a lot more history than we usually get in clinical medicine about origin of families um, from very precise regions uh, of, of the globe. Uh, at least to the degree that people know. And the people know a fair amount more than I think perhaps we give them credit for, which I think is what I think Dr. Connor was saying. I, I, so, um, and, and the reason they do that though is um, not just because they're curious and interested, um, is that they actually, I think, learn a fair amount more about the individual mutations that they are uh, seeking to understand. And so, um, and, and particularly because they're dealing with very rare mutations, um, the, the, those tend to cluster in um, very much smaller, um, let's say, genetic pools, if you will. Um, and so I think that um, the, you know, sort of this goes back into kind of the question of categorization and why is it useful and when is, you know, how, you, you know, at what point is it useful in, in the genetic arena? And I think that it really sort of, from the perspective of the genetics uh, work, it's, I think if you're thinking about a particular um, kind of variant, a really rare variant, then probably race is going to be far too coarse of a, of a tool to use for, uh, even for recruitment. Um, and having um, a lot more information about um, more proximal geographic origins or more precise geographic origins is probably more useful. Um, so um, I think I, we, we really need to be careful about why we're using it or why, how we're thinking about uh, recruiting. But I, I guess I want to reflect on what I think of as sort of a, a back to uh, Dr. Medeiros' earlier question, sort of um, why, I guess, what, what potentially the benefits are of, of using race, I think this was raised in the introductory video, um, is that, so uh, one example of a disease that's been studied for, um, in terms of disparities, is prostate cancer. Um, I think uh, many of the clinicians uh, and epidemiologists who are listening are probably aware that prostate cancer incidence is higher in black men in the United States. Um, and, and lower it, uh, in comparison to blacks in whites uh, and lower uh, in comparison to both of those groups in Asians. Um, and um, knowing that information, um, certain researchers um, actually um, recruited uh, African-Americans into their studies, um, black men into their studies uh, with the pre precisely the question of could they find genetic variants to uh, help understand this difference. Um, and uh, they have found some, and there's a 
sort of a long list of papers that have been published. Um, and this doesn't explain everything. Uh, it certainly doesn't explain disparities that arise, uh, we know from uh, treatment, uh, from referral, um, from screening and so on. Um, so there's a, a lot of other biases um, that occur that are not that that are uh, uh, completely independent of the genetics. Um, but the the difference in incidence, at least, uh, can be um, uh, potentially attributed to a very small number of variants that are only present in a very small number of individuals, on average. And so um, so in that case. Race is not in, in race is not useful in the clinical uh, space ultimately, right? I mean, we don't. It's not really race that's the driver of the disease um, at all. Um, but um, if the clinician, if the, if the researcher, uh, excuse me, thinks about it um, and can do the proper studies, then in my mind, at least, that's potentially beneficial to the people. Who potentially who carry that variant, um, and then ultimately, hopefully, can be screened uh, if the genetic information gets back to them. You know, I'd, I'd like to ask a question about this. I, I think it relates back to the uh, previous discussion that we were having earlier today. And I, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, if we continue to use race as the deciphering element that is going to construct this study, does it not perpetuate the, the belief that race is a biological construct, which is very dangerous, um, given the fact that race is not only a social construct, but one that has been um, molded by racism and white supremacy. And so if we continue to use race as this framework, we miss, and this has been um, uh, referenced in the Q&A um, uh, throughout this morning, we miss some of the social uh, determinants of health, structural forces of health like racism, other elements that are that could be really having a, a, a huge impact um, that continue to get left out of framing studies because we fall back on race, which is uh, which is problematic and actually harmful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is a. Um, I think what 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 is going on is the fact that if if currently if you don't try to seek out diverse groups of populations in your study, you will end up primarily with white populations participating. Um, and so, how does one actually um, how does one increase and diversify? Uh, their population base and, and NIH, you know, requires currently requires uh, us to uh, recruit patients based on um, uh, various uh, racial groups that have been accepted by um, the the government and so on. Uh, and so, you know, everybody tries to bin people into these groups to satisfy the NIH requirements and get that grant funded, um, but. Um, I, I agree that using just race as, as an indicator, um, um, you know, what, what is important is not to use that race as a variable to somehow stratify people between white and non-white individuals. That's when you get into troubles, and that's when a lot of the studies end up finding associations which may be spurious or non-biological. Um, but I think a race in itself, if you actually just recruit by race, um, every group, white, black, Hispanic, is highly diverse, very, very diverse. And so then the question for investigators, how do we capture that diversity separate from the, uh, the binning that we, we, we currently are obliged to do for uh, NIH applications? Uh, and that's where the challenge becomes. How do you actually then take those individuals and really uh, use them as diverse populations instead of looking at them just as, as five different uh, populations. Dr. Ziff, and then we were gonna, we're gonna turn it to an audience question. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, the sort of, I guess the, um, some of the trouble I have with the race, um, 
is or is not biology makes it like sort of a really sort of um, um, like dichotomous. So if you mean it is biology, what what are you saying? Or, or if you're saying it's not biology, what what are you saying? Um, so I, I think I, we've all agreed, or let me, do, I'll just say, I'll, I agree with the idea that race is a social construct and that it, as outlined um, by um, many uh, speakers, it was created at a certain time. I think where perhaps maybe we're, the, where some of disagreements arise here is whether, what what information race is capturing about ancestry and to what degree does that capture information about genotype? Um, and I, my argument would be that race does capture information about ancestry, albeit imperfectly. Um, and we know to some degree where it misses things or where, where it really messes up. Um, uh, Dr. Hernandez talked about admixed populations um, and, and there, there are lots of examples where, where it's, it's a very imprecise tool, particularly when it's collected in a categorical way. There are ways to collect information about race where you can say, and, and I think increasingly studies are doing that saying, check all that apply. You can ask questions about people, how not just themselves, but how about their parents and so on. Um, uh, and, but I, I think, I think the, the, I guess to me, it seems like where we say, well, since race is a social construct it therefore cannot have any offer any information about ancestry or genotype. And therefore it is, um, you know, inherently scientifically flawed and, and fraught problematically to um, think of it in that domain. Um, I, I, I can see the fact that you're saying, um, you know, linking it creates problems. Um, and I acknowledge that. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to carry with us in our minds, I, I guess the um, counter to that is that the concern I have is it, it cuts both ways in the sense that if we end up trying to completely remove it from the arena when we do genetic studies, we end up with um, biases that then create new disparities that I don't think were intentional, but, but end up um, hurting uh, people. Um, and um, so that's, I, I feel like it's, it's a difficult and, you know, fraught discussion. I guess that's why we're all here. But um, I, I think it's really being, you know, back to the title as sort of race conscious or thinking about it. Why are we using it? Um, are, have we really thought about it uh, from the perspective of, of um, you know, the sociologist as well as the patient when we when we use it in the genetic um, arena. Thank you. I am now going to turn it to Dr. Delandorf, who will be um, offering us a question from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Medeiros. Um, this is a related question um, to the last comments by Dr. Ziv, which is how can and should genetic researchers and those using genetic technologies in the clinical space engage with the history of genetics, including eugenics? to both build trust and avoid reproducing oppression. I think these things need to be discussed in training as people are going through their, their advanced training to become clinicians or to become investigators. Some folks are not aware of these historical examples and maybe aren't aware of the population genetic variation that describes within group or between group variation. So this is a subject I think uh, Dr. Medeiros referred about insiders and outsiders in the past. And I think we really need to talk about interdisciplinary education and exploring these topics across the spectrum of expertise. Um, I'll just put a plug out there. I did, uh, I did compile some resources and anti-racism toolkit for genetics educators that I'll ask the organizers to put into the chat in case folks wanna refer to those resources. And we're also starting a national initiative through the APHMG, the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics, to work with educators that have already demonstrated a curriculum that actually disentangles the understanding of race and can actually help people to shed racist ideas that they might walk into a classroom with um, just based on life experience. Um, and so this particular curriculum has been demonstrated as being effective 
in the high school space. And we're looking at adapting it into medical school and other spaces where people are talking about genetics. So for folks who are interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me or to just visit APHMG.org to see our um, upcoming workshop. Thank you, Dr. Connor. Um, I appreciate that comment a lot. I'm looking forward to looking at that resource. Um, I was gonna just add as a more broad comment, um, as some students have done for faculty, um, we wanna encourage all of our learners to really come at this with a critical mindset because ultimately we wanna graduate folks who can recognize and unpack racism in medicine and disrupt sort of the insidious impact it has for our patients and community members. So I think that means really not teaching dogmatically and teaching in a way that encourages question asking. Um, Kevin Kamashiro, who has written a lot about anti-oppressive education has some wonderful examples of the kinds of questions we should be asking, getting our students to habitually ask. So for example, one question I love that he has is, just as we're more open to learning only certain things, how might many in science communities be more open to addressing only certain issues, asking only certain questions, using only certain methods or communicating only certain findings. And I think it comes back to what Dr. Grubb said, which is this obsession we have with race and sort of the fact that it keeps coming up and again and again says something about our history in medicine and our current way of thinking about race. And so how can we really engage with students as co-learners in understanding these things and really having open discussions about, about these issues? I think I'm not sure that this addresses the quest, this precise question, but I think that you know what, what has come up here is to really be very careful. I, I, I've, I, I've advocated for the use of race as a tool for recruitment, um, racial identification as a tool for recruitment to enhance genetic ancestry. But I really think um, there been there's been a lot written about the misuse of race to infer um associations uh about biology without evidence i think that's where um we still fail in um the in current um biomedical research um and i think that um as certainly as a in, in the clinical research community we need to be really careful and really thoughtful about um if we put race in a model why did we do that? If we report it, why are we reporting it? And 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 be um, exceptionally careful about about that. And and to to um, as um, Dr. Madera sort of called out the slide that I used to really be careful about when we're using ancestry not to conflate it with race or um, vice versa. Um, I think that you know, maybe good research practices will help um, engender more trust in the future. Um, we can't really, we can't undo the past, um, uh, but I think, um, you know, we could try and be as scrupulous as we possibly can about the present. Yeah, I wanna, um, you know, I'm a strong believer that we know that individual differences are are, are, are greater than intercontinental differences in many cases. And that uh, really the goal of personalized and precision medicine is to apply our knowledge to that individual and not to um, uh, somehow spread it across the group because group contains individuals that are quite diverse in who they are, what they are, and, 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 and what their capabilities are. And so um, really, how do we get to that goal because of course, a lot of us as epidemiologists, I'm not gonna count myself as an epidemiologist, although I have been in many of those studies, is that you know, we try to average everyone, treat everyone as, as one widget and try to then um, apply those methodologies on the masses. But the challenge is how do you apply it to Zen is equal one? And that has been very, very difficult to do. Um, and when you do that, then the race is gone. There, there, there is no, there's no reason to actually, I mean, I'm talking from biological purposes. Of course, I'm not talking about a sociocultural and other political issues that the race will persist and affect the healthcare. But in terms of your, your biological propensity to disorders, your 
Uh, genetics will never, uh, it only gives you a predisposition. What is your predisposition to something? And, and how do we apply to n is equal one, uh, instead of having to group it into these very imprecise bins is I think a challenge. This leads us to um, uh, the final question, and it's definitely inspired by some of the discussions that we had in preparation for this uh, panel today. Um, we've been talking a little bit about behind the scenes about, you know, what uh, could we forecast what this could look like, this discussion could look like in five years, or the use of race um, in clinical practice, or the use of ancestry in clinical practice in five years. Will this discussion be seen as something that was of specific of a, a certain time, um, or uh, or will do you predict that the use of race and which how we're using it today will continue, um, whether it's with the recruitment of uh, of subjects for studies or it's in clinical practice? And so I'm going to open up to the panelists and see if you'd like to do a little bit of uh, prediction here and uh, and and uh, wage we'll we'll wage bets too. <laughs> I'm I'm not much of a a betting man usually, so um, so I won't uh, I won't wager much. But uh, <laughs> um, but my my hope is that um, is that with precision medicine um, we move to an era where we aren't comparing individuals to some perceived population that they might belong to, whether it be by ancestry or by race or ethnicity at all. Um, but we compare those individuals to themselves, right? Where we have an understanding of what an individual's normal is um, throughout their life. And we can see when things deviate from the expectation for that individual. Um, that is the goal in my mind. Um, and, and trying to compare to race, ethnicity or ancestry um, is actually just a stopgap measure in order in, until we can find a better way to access what an individual uh, uh, pattern should be. And do you think we'll be there by 2026? We, there, there, there should be nothing holding us back. Um, like anything that's holding us back will, um, uh, if we're not there uh, by that point, um, we will have failed. <laughs> Got it. Um, Dr. Tascupta? Thank you. I was going to comment that as we consider the future, one important fact to remember is that our populations are becoming more and more mixed in terms of ancestry. So these individual um, designations by race are becoming less and less meaningful. Um, they weren't great to begin with and they're getting worse. Uh, and so we are getting to that point, um, as Dr. Reykjavik was talking about, where we need to really be thinking about the individual, what their risk factors are. And Dr. Hernandez was talking about the, the work that's ongoing right now to develop an understanding of what those risk factors are. We're moving towards a future where genomic analysis of individuals is going to be more and more routine. And we see that already with studies that are looking at, you know, actually newborn genomic sequencing and using that as a prediction. I don't think we're going to be there in 2026, but I think that is the direction we're going in the long run. Dr. Rogovich and then Dr. Zip. You are on mute. We cannot hear you. So. Uh, just to support the, the, the move towards uh, more individualization of precision medicine, we now know that therapeutics are actually uh, now being developed towards specific variants. Also, CAR therapies are developed very personalized to your tumor. Uh, so I think we are moving in that direction. My prediction is that um, ancestry will be used more to see whether it can improve clinical care. So I think we're going to have probably some studies over the next five years using ancestry more as a, as a tool. I still think that race, because it's gonna be, it's embedded because of the historical, cultural, social, and legal processes that will remain at, at the societal level. And, um, and I think that that unfortunately will always color what physicians do because we do not work in a vacuum. Um, now, could we, could our efforts lead to uh, deconstruction of, of these issues um, I would like to be optimistic, but uh, the reality is that we're just a very small part of what happens in a society. And unfortunately, we always, physicians have always been influenced by what happens in the societal level, how they interpret things and embed them. Uh, but I hope that at the government level, these movements also, also change in, in move away from using uh, race in our uh, politics and in our um, 
uh, other discourses, um, because I think that also can color what we do with our patients too. Dr. Ziv and then Dr. Connor. Um, yeah, so I think I, I wanna also uh, echo the concept of sort of more individualization. Um, I, I guess I wanna make a comment a little bit about ancestry. I think ancestry is sort of also a proxy and kind of like a, a short term deal. Like I think it'll be perhaps useful in the next a uh, few years, maybe two to five or something. And then hopefully after that, it becomes less useful as we've learned a lot more about genetics of all of the, the whole world. Uh, maybe five is probably over ambitious, but um, it, once we learn enough about the genetics of the whole world, then um, we actually can, uh, from the genetics perspective, go to genotype. Um, so I think um, that I think it'll be more individualized. I think actually um, there's, um, a, a wonderful paper by Dr. Hernandez um, uh, that about uh, low frequency variants, really, really private variants that actually um, very, we share just probably with our immediate family members that actually drive a lot of uh, the heritability that we're all ultimately interested in. And I, I personally believe those will be really important and um, will ultimately, if we can get the information from them from the genetics perspective, uh, help all of our patients a lot more. Um, uh, and so I guess I think, I think ancestry has got a maybe two to seven year um, kind of window of being useful. Um, I think that hopefully after that, the genetics becomes a lot more useful and interesting. Um, and that I think race kind of stays because it actually has a lot more, uh, it, it's a much more complex, rich, um, and as we have talked, discussed, problematic uh, variable or uh, uh, I guess um, framework, but still um, will capture uh, a lot more about how we're practicing. I mean, I guess from, I'll just say from my own, uh, you know, in my clinical domain, you know, we look at um, in our um, clinic about, you know, kind of how we're doing in terms of managing uh, vaccine um, vaccinations or screening and so on and uh, uh, by race. And that's really all about, you know, are we making, uh, are we giving equitable care? Um, so I still think we uh, hopefully will and should um, use it from that perspective. Um, uh, and I'll stop there. So it sounds like ancestry will be the Blackberry of genetic research in about five years. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Connor? Um, I appreciate all the comments. I think the only thing I was gonna also add is you know, precision medicine is exciting. It's exciting to imagine thinking about people as individuals, for sure, um, and moving beyond a lot of the problems that come with grouping people into these um, actually very diverse groups that have social and political uh, uh, origins. But I also just want to remind us that genetics is, of course, just one small part of disease. And we need, we have issues with housing how people are dealt with in the social justice system, you know, these huge impacts on health um, that need funding and actually may have benefits that outweigh spending all of our, as much resource on precision medicine as on these other social factors and structural factors of health. And so trying to find the right balance for that in the next five years, I think is important because we have so many needs in our society that have to do with racism and structural racism, for example, that I would like to see our, our energy and funds going towards, um, not, to, not to discount the importance of precision medicine, but how do we balance those things? And I, I do think that's an important um, conversation to be having. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful way to wrap up this panel. I appreciate and honor all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, and I think I'm supposed to hand it off or do I give the official goodbye? I will hand it off. Let me add. Let me add my thanks to uh, to all of the panelists and to Dr. Medeiros for moderating it so well, and uh, really appreciate uh, all of you and your contributions uh, to this discussion. So, and let me just say that um, uh, this this uh, wraps up our three part uh, um, the first three parts of our series. We began with history. And we have um, uh, ended most of our panel discussions with looking forward to the future. But as our historian, Dr. Medeiros reminds us, history is, is our present. Um, and so I think our challenge is to actually wrestle with 
um, many of the, the hard questions that we, uh, that we uh, asked our speakers, but also that we are all faced with in trying to think about how to apply their perspectives to our work, ensuring uh, that we are at an anti-racist institution and that we are doing the best for our patients and that we are uh, providing the best possible care to all of our patients in the most equitable manner possible. And so I think that uh, as Dr. Fernandez said in our very first session, this is gonna be hard work, um, but we are, we are up to the challenge of doing this work as Dr. Grubbs reminds us. And uh, I think that this is what I hope as many of you as possible will be able to engage uh, with the ongoing discussions on this topic. Again, if you are interested in both uh, reflecting with others on what you've heard during these sessions, as well as offering us uh, an opportunity to apply this in a way that we can make our teaching, our research, and our practice better across our UC medical campuses. Uh, please join at one of these discussions. We really need people to register ahead of time. Um, and uh, you'll see that the two on medical education and research are taking place in two weeks from today on Wednesday, and the clinical practice session in uh, three weeks from today. These are all Wednesday morning sessions. And, uh, and, and please join, this will be the opportunity to have more small group discussions on this very important topic. And again, then just in closing, let me thank uh, all of our speakers, our steering committee, our students, uh, everyone who has really um, participated in uh, how we have uh, tried to construct this conversation and uh, look forward to this being just the first of many more conversations on this important topic. Thank you so much.